But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. King James Bible, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright, you're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. Oh, we are back for another episode of On the Move with Mac Worley III. I, of course, am your host, Mac Worley. I am so excited to speak with you all today. I think you're going to like today's show. Um, not trying to toot my own horn here, but I've put together uh, a really interesting episode today. Um, this is just based on things that I've seen in the news and things that I felt are pressing and trends and things that I'm talking to people about with both on the left and the right, on the far left and the far right. And the overarching message that I want to give to you today is love. Love. Love is everything. I love you. First of all, MacPack, I love you guys. You guys are awesome. You are the tip of the spear. And I really do appreciate you tuning in week after week to listen to me, to engage, have a conversation, talk about the issues. But we need love. We need love now more than ever. Love is strong. Love is is stronger than hate. And that's what I intend to talk to you about today. That is why today's episode is titled Hate vs. Love. This is episode 142 of On The Move. By the way, uh, I can't believe it slipped my attention. I can't believe I missed it until now. Uh, But in case you were wondering, this show has been on the air for three years this month. This is our third anniversary. Um, I just, I really, you know, I, I want to take a moment to really just thank you guys. Uh, I, I really want to just, you know, give my thanks for the time that you've spent um, really just thinking about issues that, that affect us daily, thinking about liberty, liberty, thinking about how you as an individual can make a difference. And... I, you know, from the bottom of my heart, I, I really appreciate everything, folks. Um, this experience has been such a blessing to me. It has been the most amazing thing that I could have ever done. And I did this on a fluke. Uh, I, I just started one day doing a podcast. And by the way, I recommend go, go back to my first podcast. It is terrible. Uh, and I haven't really gotten much better, but, uh, you know, at least the audio is a little better, um, from time to time, <laughs> but I, I was, I was figuring it out today and, you know, granted we've had, uh, you know, a few days off here and there, but uh, I, I want you to kind of get an idea of, of the process here, the evolution, if you will, of, uh, my philosophy and ideology and, kind of understand why I am where I am. Um, I, I've mentioned to you all before, when I was young, I was uh, a, a young, dumb Democrat. Uh, you know, I voted for John Kerry, and the, I didn't know what I was doing. Again, I, I've, I've told you before, I didn't know anything about politics. People around me were voting for him against Bush, and I thought that was the right thing to do at the time. Uh, I wouldn't do it now, obviously. Uh, but I have spent so much time, as a result of this show, learning and thinking critically about liberty and and the way that our government affects our individual rights, our natural rights, the rights that we created government to protect. So, I I, I was doing some math earlier, and... uh, I, I mean, granted, I've I you know I take an odd day off here or there, uh, but you know I, I've done as far as I'm I'm able to figure out right now. I've done just as a result of this show, studying and and preparing for things for the show because I do about roughly you know eight to six hours of uh, of work every episode on this show every Sunday. I'm I'm studying, I'm doing things, I'm 
I'm I'm doing research online, uh, and this is not this doesn't even include the things I do in my off time just for the heck of it. Uh, but I've spent over this three year period of time on this show. I've spent over a thousand hours, a thousand two hundred and something hours, uh, just researching, um, just in the last three years, just researching on Sundays. This is what I do with my time, and uh, I feel like I still have so much left to learn. But I feel like I have I have I have evolved in a lot of ways. You know, again, I told you I I originally was a a Democrat voter, and then I voted for McCain, and I still didn't really know what I was or what I was doing much about it. But I realized I wasn't a Democrat, and, and then as time progressed, I started to know a little bit more. And I voted for. Um, oh shoot! What is that fella's name? Um, he, uh, Romney. I voted for Romney, and uh, you know I didn't particularly like him, but I kind of just you know plugged my nose and and took the medicine, and uh, I thought he was progressive, and I didn't really like him as a candidate. Uh, I thought he was incredibly weak as a candidate, but I thought he'd be better than Obama, so I voted for him. Um, now look, you guys don't have, by the way, you don't have to agree with me, and that's the beauty of liberty. As long as I'm not harming you, or, or you know, taking any of your property, then, you know, that, that's that's the way liberty works. We're allowed to have different opinions. If you if you were a big Romney supporter, more power to you. I, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, this, this does not matter. And again, I, this show this is about love. I want us to come together, and I'm not doing a kumbaya hippie moment here, folks, where, you know, we're singing songs around a campfire, but I, I just, I want us to love one another, and, and how we do that is to understand one another. You know, it, it really struck me as crazy, this election. That the Democrats were the ones saying about uh, saying things about love, the, their candidates anyway, Obama and, and Hillary Clinton, obviously, uh, they kept pounding this drum in a lot of ways, saying that you know love, 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 and um, you know I, I I really do think that that is a winning message. Uh, it's just it's coming out of the the wrong mouths. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of it, it seems a little bit disingenuous coming from f- folks like them, um, but I really feel like the the game has changed, and and I'm I'm concerned about the animosity between the right and left, and that swinging pendulum that we have discussed before, especially now that the government is in the hands of of the Republicans, the Senate, the House, the presidency. You know, come January when. President-elect Trump takes office. Things are going to change. And the Republicans have a mandate to get things done. So how far will they swing that pendulum? And will they take this opportunity to dismantle the government's power? Will they take this opportunity to make sure that no one ever again can use this government to violate the rights of others? Or will they swing the pendulum further to the right and when they eventually lose power, will that pendulum swing back to the left just as far, if not further, than where it currently is? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I hope that they will do the right thing. I'm hopeful. But I, I'm i one of those kind of guys that uh, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Um, I really do think that this, even though it seems like this, is, you know, we're coming off a big win. If you're right leaning, if you if you consider yourself a Republican, uh, you know, if if you or if you voted for Donald Trump, whatever, um, this may seem like a big win, and we have to be so careful, so so careful about how we use the power that we have now, because if we're using it to expand the government's power, the federal government's power then ultimately, whenever we lose power, and we will lose power one day, we're going to lose power again. And I'm not even necessarily certain if we, I'm using air quotes here, are in power. I don't know who Trump is. I, I have a pretty good idea based on his past, but I don't know what he's actually going to do. Trump himself has said he can be 
whoever he needs to be. So who is the real Donald Trump? Will the real Donald Trump please stand up? I have an inkling that he will. And I don't know who that man will be. So, today, this is episode 142 of our program. This is titled, Hate vs. Love. We're going to be talking about, here are featured topics, why the alt-right is anti-liberty and dangerous. I want to play some terrifying audio from Kymeros on hate. Then I want to contrast that with Reverend King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., on love, power, and nonviolent struggle. Then I want to play a, or I want to talk about something that I missed last week, and I think I might lead with this when we come back from the break, uh, about a Trump supporter who was arrested for his T-shirt, his T-shirt, and uh, about a man who was wearing a uh, MAGA hat, a Make America Great hat, uh, Make Great Again, uh, Make America Great Again had uh, that was allegedly attacked in New York City on the subway. And if we have time to get to it, I want to play a clip um, from Learn Liberty. Uh, it was titled Making Sense of Trumpism. So I want to play that. I want to uh, analyze it a little bit and uh, give you some commentary and some perspective. So uh, first of all, uh, let's go ahead and do some housekeeping before we cut to a commercial break. We broadcast on this show every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you can get our show uh, at onthemoveshow.com. You can get it at spreaker.com slash onthemoveshow. I would most certainly appreciate it if you would follow us over there. Uh, it really does help us. The more people that follow us, the more pe people that will find us, and you will be doing your part to help spread the message of liberty. So thank you so much for that. Again, that's spreaker.com, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com slash on the move show. You can like us on Facebook.com slash on the move show. You can also message us over there as well, and we'll read your message on the air if deemed worthy. Also, you can get us on Twitter at on the move show. Send your messages again to us there, uh, or you can subscribe to us on YouTube.com slash on the move show. Also, if you'd like to join today's conversation, and I would most certainly appreciate it if you would call us, the number of the show is 360 450 5625. Again, that's 360 450 Four five zero five six two five. Please feel free to give us a call. I'd rather have a conversation with you than sit up here giving you a monologue. But you know, we'll see how things go. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll be right back after this break, folks. You don't want to go anywhere. And by the way, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention that uh, we are going to be having a special guest join us uh, for the second hour at nine fifteen uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's six fifteen. Pacific, for those of you out there on the West Coast. Uh, his name is Peter Owens. He's the editor-in-chief of Groundswell Liberty and former host of Common Sense Conservative. Uh, Conservative. And he is uh, hes actually a former guest on the show. We've had him on the show before. Uh, he's a, a young man doing a lot of good stuff, and I'm really, really excited to talk with him. So you guys really don't want to miss this show. we got a lot on the agenda. We'll be right back after this break. Don't go anywhere. Have you visited the On The Move with Mac Worley store? We've got amazing original design t-shirts, hoodies, cell phone cases, and coffee mugs for sale at onthemoveshow.com. Just click the shop link on our homepage. You won't want to miss out on the iHeart Open Carry and Bear Arms t-shirts for only $20 plus shipping. Again, just go to onthemoveshow.com and click the shop link on our homepage. Your purchases will help make the On The Move show bigger and better. We appreciate your support. Are you an activist who needs affordable flyers or brochures for passing out literature? Or a political candidate who is looking for business cards, logo designs, yard signs, or vehicle decals? Email me, Latasha Worley, for all your graphic design needs at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, -A, Worley at gmail.com. And don't forget to mention On The Move to get a 10% discount on all graphic design services. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military 
reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore with the support of like-minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright, you're listening to On The Move with Matt Worley III. And we're back. All right, so let's get this thing started, shall we? I want to talk about our first featured topic. Why is the alt-right anti-liberty? Why are they dangerous? I have expressed this to you before. I have said that I believe that this movement is nationalist. I believe that it is Marxist. I believe, and so far as it is Marxist, it is... uh, Again, let me backtrack and explain here. Marxism. Core tenets of Marxism are redistribution of wealth and central planning. So, the alt-right is for redistribution of wealth. Alright, let's be clear about that. They are also for central planning. Um, So, and we've discussed this in the past. Uh, Let's also point out that... They are nationalist. They have expressed a very, um, very nationalist sentiment. And I, I think the best way to express this is for me to go back uh, to a conversation I had with someone who I consider to be a ally in the liberty movement. Um, and let, I don't know if I should really put this person's stuff out there. I'm going to refrain for right now. Uh, let's just call this person a friend, or let's uh, rather an acquaintance. Uh, but I, I've had this uh, this outstanding conversation or ongoing conversation with uh, with this individual for a while, and he's been trying to convince me to join the alt right, and I'm saying no, I'm I'm not going to do that. Uh, I, I think the alt-right is nationalist. I think they're Marxist. I think they're also so- socialist and fascist and, and ultimately fascist. That's really, it's the neo-Nazi party. That is what it is. Um, they're nationalist socialists, which has already been been taken by someone in history before. So I'm warning all my friends about, again, it, on both sides, you, you have to look out for the extreme dreams, the fringes. Uh, you have to be so, so careful about the company you keep. And the reason why is because many of these people uh, who are advocating for extremism on both sides, you know, the collectivism uh, and, and things that will violate natural rights of individuals using governmental force or whatever, um, many of these people don't come outright and tell you that they, they want to kill people. That they think you should be able to kill people that disagree with them or that it, 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 th- whatever, whatever. They don't want to come out right and say they hide behind little slogans or talking points. They they don't come out overtly and advocate all the time, especially if they're being recorded, um, especially if they know that they're being recorded. Uh, which is why I, you know, I think citizen journalism is important, and you know I've supported uh, people like Dan Sandini of the Daylight Disinfectant. Check him out, DaylightDisinfectant.com. He has covertly gone down into the belly of the beast in Portland to covertly record these these communists, these socialists, these Marxists, these anarchists, the unions, the illegal, uh, the illegals down there, the Black Panthers. He has, him and Mike Strickland, by the way, laughing at liberals, they have, and myself obviously, have gone down to covertly record and show what they are doing. Show what they actually believe. And when it ultimately comes down to it, they believe in the complete destruction of the capitalist system. They believe in top-down, heavy-handed government telling you what you can 
can do, where you can do it, and how you can do it. They believe that the government knows better than you, and therefore the government can use force against you if the government deems what you're doing to be something that they don't like. And, and this is an immoral philosophy, in my opinion. Using force against people who aren't hurting other people and not taking other people's stuff is immorally, uh, or, or is immoral, period. And, and this, is, this is the way I look at it. Now, you can disagree, and that's, again, that's the beauty of, of liberty. You're allowed to disagree with me. So back to this conversation. I was talking with this, this uh, alt-right guy. And again, I, I, now I see, I remember why I deviated now. You want to be careful about who you surround yourself with. Because again, they're, they're not going to tell you who, who they are all the time. They're not, and, and you, if you're not listening, you may miss who they are. So be careful about associating with the far left. Be careful with associating with the far right. And try to identify people and understand what they're actually saying. So I'm listening. I'm, I'm doing my best to listen to everyone. And I have, again, listened to this uh, Trump supporter. This is a Trump supporter in the alt-right. Uh, and he has, he has been telling me how he thinks that you should be able to kill people who are illegal immigrants. You should be able to kill uh, gun, ad, or gun control advocates. So I, I've, I read in a previous episode, I have read an excerpt from the conversation we had. And it has, you know, I, I kind of stayed away from him after the election. He kept hitting me up and I didn't, I didn't really want anything to do with it. I didn't say anything to him for a while. Um, and he asked me, he would like a reaction, uh, a reply on my thoughts of the election results. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm not going to engage on this. Uh, but what I did engage with is I asked him, do you still think it's okay to kill people who disagree with you? And again, this is how the, the conversation went. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read the conversation here. I'm looking at my Facebook log right now. And uh, I, I'm just going to read to you what we, you know, what we discussed. So uh, anyway, he says, uh, after I ask him, do you think it's still okay to kill people who disagree with you? Um, or who you disagree with, he says, no. It's, o- it, it's okay to kill violent liberals, though, and waterboard them, like the rioters. Did I tell you Trump would win, though? Or, or, I'm sorry, he said, I did tell you Trump would win, though. I did tell you nationalism is superior to cuck-servativism. All right? Now, keep, keep this in mind. When you start hearing things like cuck-servativism, all right, um, th- these are red flags. The, and, and I'm hearing some of my, my conservative friends start calling people cucks. Uh, this is not a this is not a phrase that I was familiar with. I started asking people about it, and I this is a this is a term coined by the alt right, cuck servative, cuck servative. Um, I won't get into the term, but uh, anyway. So he continues here. I was paying attention to European politics. The same patterns. This is him speaking. The same patterns are, are appearing in Europe. I would like you to join us, to unite with us, because the alt-right, they know how to win Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, Wyoming, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. It's like conservatism that respects the working class and doesn't shoot itself in the the foot. I ask you to unite with me and the alt-right. Let us bring the uh, constitutional carry to Kentucky. This is one of the—he thinks this is going to sway me here. He keeps trying to— to convince me that the alt-right is the only way to get constitutional carry in Kentucky. I don't buy it. And by the way, uh, I'm, uh, FYI, I'm hearing some news that Donald Trump is talking about a national reciprocity for uh, uh, concealed carry. I think I'm saying that right, reciprocity. Maybe I'm wrong. I, don't, I, I, I always mess that word up. So uh, I, I inquire again with another question after he says this big, long spiel. I say, so if, if someone wants to pass a gun law, should we be able to kill them? He says, ask the founding fa- founding fathers, is that gun law constitutional carry? And I say, I'm asking you. You don't have an opinion? He says, mine is the same as the founders. Again, very, he's dodging. He keeps dodging the question. And he says, are you going to unite with our new winning team? And FYI, I don't give a crap if your team is winning or not. I, you know, for 2008, uh, Obama won. Should we join up to, with him because he won? No. If you're wrong, you're wrong. 
if you are immoral, you're immoral. It doesn't matter if you win. That doesn't suddenly change the game all of a sudden just because you won an election. I voted for Daryl Castle. And if you're out there in listener land, you're probably asking yourself, who the hell is Daryl Castle? <laughs> That's my point. I don't care if who I vote for wins. I'm voting for the person I feel is the best for the job. I like Daryl Castle the best. I didn't like Donald Trump. I definitely didn't like Hillary Clinton either. So, and I, I had considered voting for Gary Johnson initially, but his campaign fell apart. I am really just shocked at how not libertarian Gary Johnson is. But I digress. Let's continue with the conversation with the alt-right guy. Uh, he says, uh, we can bring constitutional carry to so many states. The alt-right knows how to win, and we proved it. It's really simple. By the way, and let me... Let, let me stop it right there. Uh, the alt right is a fraction, a, a, a fringe group. It is not a huge group. Uh, the alt right is not who won this election. It is the same people who voted for, by the way, Don, uh, uh, Donald Trump also, in many cases in these swing states, voted for Barack Obama. These aren't alt right. These guys aren't hateful people. These guys aren't people that, that believe that. Um, you know, it's okay, by the way, these aren't people that are anti-Jew, uh, anti-gay, um, the, the, anti-humanity, really. All right, Th that is what the alt-right is. So, the alt-right didn't win this election. Um, and we're going we're gonna to de deconstruct Trumpism and, and some, of the, uh, some of the reasons why he might have won this election. Um, but it wasn't because of the alt-right. Uh, but he says, it, it's simple, really. No right-winger is bad, and no left-winger is good. No right-winger is bad, and no left-winger is good. Uh, see, that's just not... Th this is rhetoric. This is just not true. He says, we are here to unite the right. It's the only way we progress. Leave your losing ways behind and join us. Our, I our I ideology is reality. Our ideology is strength. Our ideology is winning. We turned Ohio and Iowa red. We flipped Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. So, this is again. This is this is his pitch. He's trying to sell me on this. I'm I'm not I'm not coming over to the alt right, folks. I'm just not. Um, so I ask him again. I say, so you are telling me that you support the right of the people to advocate for unconstitutional laws. You don't support attacking or using government against people who are simply expressing their opinion. He says. There is no right to advocate for unconstitutional laws. So I ask him again, or actually I say, uh, this is my response. I say, yes, there is. It's called freedom of speech. So you think we should be able to kill them? He says, lawmaking is not speech. It's an action. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. I respond to him, advocacy is speech. If you are, and this is me speaking now, if you are advocating for something, you are speaking. He says, action is not speech. Saying, I don't like guns is free, free speech. Saying, I don't like guns and I'm going to ban them is a declaration of action against our rights. Just like saying, I don't like you is free speech, but saying, I don't like you so I'm going to kill you and your family is a threat to action. Are you starting to understand now? He's asking me this. This guy's very condescending, by the way. Uh, he goes on. He says, I, I consider gun control advocacy a threat and so did our founders. To not counter that action against our rights is utter foolishness. Reality before ideology always. I ask you to unite with the alt-right and help make Kentucky into a constitutional carry uh, state. I say, saying anything is speech. The action may be unconstitutional but does, does that mean that the mob should be able to kill who, the people who suggested it? Advoca advocacy is only speech. Are you pro-speech? He says, it depends on how far they're willing to take it. What are you trying to ask in your se second sentence? I said, advocacy is only speech. And I asked him if he was pro-speech. Then he continues. He, he says, it makes no sense what I was saying. He, he, doesn't, he must not understand or agree that advocacy is only speech. It is speaking. Advocacy. To advocate. In fact, since I am here, since we're here now, let's go to dictionary.com. And let's see what the definition of advocate is means advocate here we go advocate one more time or advocate okay uh, alright so it means to speak or write in favor of support or urge by argument recommend publicly uh, so to speak 
to speak. To advocate is to speak. That is the dictionary.com definition, folks. Advocacy is speech. You are either pro-speech or you're not pro-speech. You are either for, pro, uh, for free speech or you are against free speech. Anyway, he continues. Um, he says, uh, let's just say I support Jared Lau uh, Launer, I think that's how you say his name, on the charge of shooting Gabby Giffords and Dylan Roof on the charge of shooting Clementa Pickney, or uh, Pinkney, uh because the victims are gun grabbers. So this is, this is the alt-right. This is where you get a, a look behind the curtain, folks. Uh, again, you may have thought this person was, was pro-liberty. He's talking about gun rights. Oh, yeah, I'm very pro-Second Amendment. Hell, yeah. But I'm not pro-killing people for speech. I'm not pro-killing people. Again, I'm pro-love. I think the most important thing we have in this world is each other. Humanity. And I'm pro-life in every sense of the word. I'm pro -life. I'm I'm against the death penalty. If it, I mean it, I I cannot get behind this. And I, I hope I hope you're looking. I hope you're listening. So I, I say in this conversation, I say uh, the next thing: advocacy is the act of speaking in favor of something. That speech. Are you pro free speech? He says, uh, but keep the other charges. He's talking about these uh, these killers, these uh, homicidal maniacs who attempted to attack people. Again, uh, I'm not a big fan of Gabby, Gab, Gabby Gifford's policies. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not in favor of what she uses her speech for. But again, I'm pro free speech. I will I will gladly gladly go out and debate Gabby Gifford. In fact, if Gabby Gifford ever wanted to come on this show, I would be happy to have her on and I would gladly disagree with her on every issue regarding uh, regarding government and statism and, and gun control I continue in this conversation or actually he, he continues he says uh, yeah I'm pro free speech I want to repeal hate speech laws in Europe so does the alt-right so this guy considers himself like a European nationalist all right this is uh, th he's he's really uh, dug into the the European uh, neo-nazi nationalist movements over there and uh, again, I, I, th there is a rise of, of nationalism, fascism, neo-Nazism in Europe. And it's coming here in the form of the alt-right. So I say, uh, why do you keep dodging how you feel? If you think killing someone for what they say is okay, why don't you just say it? He says, no, I didn't say that. You keep saying that over and over in a roundabout way. He says, I think every... Every gun grabber, uh, gun grabber death is a good death. And if someone kills a gun grabber, I will not condemn them. You support killing gun control advocates, yes or no? This is me asking that. He says, because our founding fathers are just as guilty of killing gun grabbers. This is what I'm talking about. Yes or no? He says it again. He says, I am always okay with gun grabbers dying or getting hurt badly. I ask, so Yes. He says, I support people getting rid of gun grabbers by any means necessary. All right. So I keep digging and digging and digging and digging. And by the way, this man can't give you a straight answer. He won't tell you yes or no. He cannot answer yes or no because he knows if he does, he's out of himself for what he truly is, a fascist, a Marxist. And by the way, make no mistake, fascism may be on the right, on the political right. But it is Marxist. It cannot exist without Marxism. Fascism requires Marxism because the core tenets of Marxism is central planning and redistribution of wealth. And that is necessary for fascism. And that's not just me saying that, by the way. That's Hayek. If, if, you, have, if, you, have a, if you have a disagreement, go, go, you know, go take it up with Hayek. All right? Uh, pretty sure he's not, he's not with us anymore, sadly. Um, so this, this uh, alt-right guy continues, if Shannon Watts gets raped, I'm totally okay with it. I just hope a minority with an STD does it, because it would be poetic justice. And I hope a gun rights advocate or activist gets her daughter pregnant, and then her daughter gets an NRA tramp stamp, LOL, and has a porno uh, with uh, her getting plowed 
This, I mean, this is terrible. Uh, by the way, I apologize. I apologize for this. This is terrible. I don't want to. I don't want to air this on the show. I don't like this. But you need to hear it. So I respond. You are advocating for violence, including rape and murder. He says, "Nope." I'm just advocating for justice, just like our founders did. Yeah, I, I remember that part where George Washington was talking about how, you know, uh, Shannon Watts should get raped or, or, or King George should get raped and get an STD. And, uh, it, yeah, I, I, I think I remember somewhere in the Federalist Papers, somebody saying about, uh, you know, their opposition's daughter getting an NRA tramp stamp and having a porno made. Uh, yeah, I think I remember that somewhere and getting plowed. That's that's in the Federalist Papers, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> anyway, so he continues. Um, he says, uh, I, I'm advocating for justice just like our founding fathers did. By the way, I'm also okay with alcohol pro prohibitionists getting killed. I wish Al Capone would have whacked Carrie Nation. I say, you are so angry. Hate will always lose in the end. He says, wrong. I say, we, met, we never make good decisions when we're angry. He says... Uh, watch this video. Hate is what makes us human. The founding fathers hated King George's men, and that was beautiful hate. I embrace my hate for gun grabbers and turn it into energy. So no, hate will always win. This is what he says. And then he linked me a video by Kai Rose. Now, we're going to cut to a commercial break. When we come back, I'm going to play this really disturbing video and uh, you're going to get to peer behind the curtain, folks. You're going to get to see what the alt-right is truly about. And it's not pretty. So we'll be right back after this break, folks. You, you really don't want to go anywhere. Have you visited the On The Move with Mac Worley store? We've got amazing original design t-shirts, hoodies, cell phone cases, and coffee mugs for sale at onthemoveshow.com. Just click the shop link on our homepage. You won't want to miss out on the iHeart Open Carry and Bare Arms t-shirts for only $20 plus shipping. Again, just go to onthemoveshow.com and click the shop link on our homepage. Your purchases will help make the On The Move show bigger and better. We appreciate your support. Are you an activist who needs affordable flyers or brochures for passing out literature? Or a political candidate who's looking for business cards, logo designs, yard signs, or vehicle decals? Email me, Latasha Worley, for all your graphic design needs at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com. And don't forget to mention On The Move to get a 10% discount on all graphic design services. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, pledging my life, my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright, you're listening to On the Moon with Matt Worley III. Alrighty, we're back. Thanks for sticking with us. If you'd like to join today's program, give us a call. The number of the show is 360-450-5625. Again, that's 360-450-5625. You can get us on Facebook.com slash On The Move Show. You can get us on Twitter at On The Move Show. <clears throat> and this episode is about love. Love versus hate. When we last left, we were talking 
uh, about a conversation I had with an alt-right fellow. And you were getting a look behind the curtain at the alt-right. And, again, I, I, by the way, I my condemnation for the alt-right is uh, nothing to take away from the left. Uh, it's it, it, I'm I'm not taking away anything from the left. I can I can disagree with both the right and the left. It's beautiful like that. That's what happens when you think freely and you don't listen to to uh, you know uh, or you don't let other people make up your mind for you. When you when you base your judgment off of a set of principles instead of what the people around you say or think or tell you to think, you don't let political correctness dictate what you think. And you don't let pressure from someone else or fear, fear of violence, fear of being ostracized, affect what you say or think. So, the last, the last we were talking, um, this individual told me to watch a video. He said that hate is what makes us human. The founding fathers hated King George's men, and that was beautiful hate. He says that he embraces his hate for gun grabbers and turned it into energy. So no, hate will always win. He disagreed with me when I said hate will always lose in the end. So let's go ahead and dive down this deep, dark path. And when we get to the end of it, I'm going to contrast this, all right? We're not going completely into the dark. I'm going to lead you out, I promise. So here's Kai Moros on hate. Nowadays, there's a lot of talk about hate crimes. There's an entire body of laws against hate crimes. Everybody seems to be worried about hate. Hate appears to be the gravest problem of our time. But hate is good. Hate gives a structure to our life. Hate gives us a reason to exist, a focus, something to strive for, an identity. Hate is energy, pure energy, provided by Mother Nature herself. Hate enables us to see through lies and pretense, and helps us to concentrate on the essential. Hate is democratic, even the So first, let me just cut this up real fast here. I, I don't want to interrupt because I don't want it to take away from this. But he says that hate um, allows us to see through things. Um, I, I disagree. I think hate blinds us. We'll, we'll continue. I, I won't interrupt him anymore. Here he goes. The rich and the powerful cannot hate more than their slaves and subjects. And soon, hate may well be all that we have left. Hate emancipates. Without hate for slavery, you cannot break your shackles. And without hate for injustice, there can be no justice. The greatest achievements of the human race have grown from hate and from the ability to control hate. Hate separates humans from animals. Animals do not hate, but humans do. Humans can hate for decades, sometimes their entire life. We can even pass hate on to our children and keep hate alive for centuries. Hate is a sign of abstract intellect, for only humans can hate people they have never seen or met, and only humans can hate concepts and processes. How can we know what love is if we refuse to recognize and understand hate? Love and hate are the two opposite sides of the same coin. Without hate, we are only halflings. In order to be complete, we need hate. Only fools talk endlessly about love, but forget the hate. Hate separates us from the meek and docile masses. Do not fear hate. Do not deny or reject hate. Accept hate. Embrace hate. Learn to know it and learn to use it. Hate is your most powerful weapon, a hidden source of your strength. Do not deny it from you. What the liberal elite fears most in this world is our ability to hate, because our hate will one day be the most revolutionary force on the planet. Our hate will destroy and create empires. Wow. Okay, so he said a lot. Um, he said, uh, hate is all we have left. He said, uh, it's only hate for slavery that uh, resulted in and people abolishing it. It's uh, only people's ability to, to hate, or to control their hate, uh, that 
uh, has allowed for achievements. It's said that hate could be passed on for generations. Hate is a sign of abstract intellect. Uh, hate is the other side of the coin uh, from love, and that we need hate to be complete, and only fools speak about love. This is Kai Morose. So, this man I believe to be extremely dangerous, and uh, I'll go ahead and post this. Uh, you know, no, I won't. No, I, I'm not going to post this on. You can find this. This is called Kai Morose on hate. If you if you really want to listen to this again, I'm not putting this on my timeline. I'm just not. Sorry. So, <sighs> hate is all we have left. Let's go with that one first. No, hate isn't all we have left. I have a lot of other things left. I have my family. I have my 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 liberty. I have my health. I ha I have a lot of th I have love. I have love. And if it is foolish to only speak about love, well, then consider me a fool. I uh, I think love is a powerful force. And it's not a force that... It's not a force that that, that, uh, that cuts. As I think it was Dr. King who said that. Love is such a powerful force. Love. Showing love for your enemy. Showing love for your fellow man. Showing humanity to people who are being inhuman. Showing love. Love is all we need. The Beatles. The Beatles sang that. Look. I don't think that it was hate for slavery that ended slavery, but rather love for freedom. Love for our fellow man. Yeah, you, you might be able to pass on hate, but people eventually make up their own minds. And if, if that were true, if hate was able to be distilled throughout generations, if it was so powerful that it could just be passed on without, without anybody being able to change their mind, to evolve on that issue, to stop hate, if that were true, then slavery wouldn't have ended. If that were true, then we wouldn't be at a point where we elected a black president. He says, hate is a sign of abstract intellect. Now let me point out, I, I disagree. I think that uh, hate is a primal reaction. To succumb to hate makes you weak, incredibly weak. To hate is to allow yourself to succumb to your baser instincts. I think overcoming that and loving shows that you have abstract intellect. Shows that you are more than just an, a savage animal. Love and hate may be on the same coin, but they are most definitely different sides of that coin. Love can't exist without hate, yes. Just like light cannot exist without darkness. But you need to look into yourself and decide who you want to be. Do you want to be hateful? Do you want to embrace the hate and turn it into energy? Or do you want to love your fellow man? I think the amount of of control that we have. He talks about harnessing, you know, being in control of your hate, your ability to control your hate. I I I, I disagree with this. First of all, I think hating is the act of losing control, losing your intellect. In order to love, especially to love someone who's wronged you, you have to. You have to be able to think abstractly. You have to be able to think of concepts such as forgiveness. 
And that's the most powerful thing of all, forgiving somebody who's transgressed against you, to turn the other cheek, metaphorically speaking. And by the way, I opened up this show today with a quote from the Bible. I am not a religious man, um, but the way I look at religion is that, and again, you don't have to agree with me. You don't have to. Um, the way I look at religion is that it's a moral guideline. It tells you how to live a moral life, depending on the religion. I think some religions are moral and some are not. Christianity, on, on in particular, I think Christianity is a is a moral religion. Um, now, I think it can be perverted and twisted and turned, but if based on what I know of, of Christianity, and by the way, I grew up in the church. I, I grew up in a church of God. You know, I, I used to go to church every Sunday and on Wednesday. And I remember at one point we had this thing called revivals. Oh, man, that was like a week or so of just straight going to church. I remember singing songs like I'll fly away. Yeah, oh, man, I was I grew up in this 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 kind of stuff. So and I'm an interested party when it comes to religion. I have researched a lot of different religions. I've researched Islam. I've researched Christianity. I've researched Buddhism. I mean, I, I'm just interested. So I, I, even as an adult, even though I'm, I consider myself agnostic, I have taken the time to to research this stuff. And I do believe that Christianity is compatible with libertarianism. By the way, I fully believe it. I think that we're natural allies, and I think there is a lot of wisdom to be gained from the Bible, because again, I. I think I look at these as, as moral guidelines. Oh, by the way, uh, Judaism, I've researched that as well. So, now, now that we've talked about hate, now that we've looked behind the curtain of the alt-right, the nationalist movements that are going on in Europe, I want to continue this uh, this conversation that this uh, this alt-right supporter and I were having. So he told me to watch that video that I just played for you on Kai Morose. And he says, hate will always win. And he continues, he said, I've spoken to Kai Morose. This is him. He says, I consider him a mentor. Same with David Duke. Now, David Duke, you may be familiar with this this gentleman. And that's uh, using that word rather loosely. Um, I believe he was in the KKK. Let's go ahead and uh, let's, let's bring up uh let's his uh his uh oh yeah okay he's the uh the former imperial wizard of the ku klux klan oh yeah so he, he can this this guy considers david duke a mentor he's an american white nationalist politician anti-semite semite conspiracy theorist holocaust denier and former imperial wizard of the ku klux ku klux klan the kkk folks so, um, this is the alt-right. It's, it's where white supremacists, uber-nationalists, socialists, fascists, neo-Nazis, all combine. So, the conversation continues. Uh, he says, uh, I am part of the European nationalist movement. We're going to bring nationalism to the USA and defeat the Marxist. Again, he's so confused he doesn't even understand that his own ideology is Marxist. He said, conservatism was not enough to win. We need a stronger movement. Now that Trump has been elected, it begins. If you truly care about liberty, you will unite with us. Again, he's trying to appeal to constitutional carry. Constitutional carry in Kentucky will happen. Don't you want to help? And he tells me, you should learn that political correctness is losing its power. I'm, okay, all right. I, I believe that that you know, selection was a rebuke against that in some ways. Um, so now let's look at the other side of the love-hate coin. Let's move to somebody who I consider a mentor. Somebody who... You know, if, if I'm going to, to look at somebody's philosophy and see who did it and who could be, who I should look up to, one of my biggest mentors is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
He was a martyr for his cause. This man advocated for nonviolent struggle. This is what I advocate for. I am a pacifist, really. Although, I believe in the right to defend yourself. And for the purposes of political activism, I believe that nonviolent struggle is the path forward. I believe that if, if we're truly to make change within our form of government, the most dangerous weapon we can ever wield is nonviolent struggle. It is t- it is toppled regimes. It has been effective throughout history, time and time again. And the reason why, the reason why nonviolent struggle is so effective, is because when people have power, governments, when governments have power, the only way that they know how to respond to threats to their power is force. When the only tool that you have in your toolbox is a nail, every I'm sorry, is a hammer. <laughs> Let me restart that. When the only tool that you have in your toolbox is a hammer, every problem you see looks like a nail. Brute force, and and that is beneficial to nonviolent struggle. When you're using nonviolent tactics, nonviolent resistance, and nonviolence is not passive. Again, I call myself a pacifist, but I do believe in the right to defend yourself. And I also do believe in nonviolent struggle. And it's not inaction. It is action. And it is braver than anything you can ever do. To go out and knowingly put yourself in danger. To throw yourself into the machine. To try to jam up the cogs. Nothing can be braver. Because you know that if they want to hurt you, they can. And if they do, you don't react. You don't fight back. Nothing can be more brave. Because you're doing something not for yourself, but for others. And that is the only thing worth doing in this world. So now to Dr. King. This is Dr. King. On love and power. <clears throat> Excuse me, love and power. Here's a clip. What happened uh, is that some of our philosophers got off base. And one of the great problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have usually been contrasted as opposites, polar opposites. So that love is identified with a resignation of power and power with a denial of love. It was this misinterpretation that caused uh, the philosopher Nietzsche, who was the philosopher of the will to power, to reject the Christian concept of love. It was the same misinterpretation which induced Christian theologians to reject Nietzsche's philosophy of the will to power in the name of the Christian idea of love. Now, we got to get this thing right. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best. Power at its best is love. Implementing the demands of justice and justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. So let me just reiterate that. He said, what is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. If we truly love our fellow man, like we love ourselves, then we wouldn't want to use force. We wouldn't want to make them do things against their will. We would want to treat them like we treat ourselves. And I love you. I don't want you to be forced to do something against your will. I love you like I love myself. 
And I do believe that love is what we need now. So Dr. King, he talked more about this. He talked so much about love and nonviolence. Here's Dr. King on love and nonviolence. Well, I don't think of uh, love as, uh, in this context, as emotional bosh. I don't think of it as uh, a weak force. But I, I think of love as something strong and that organizes itself into powerful uh, direct action. Now, this is what I try to teach in the struggle in the South, that uh, we are not engaged uh, in a struggle that means we sit down and do nothing. Uh, that there's a great deal of difference between non-resistance to evil and non-violent resistance. Uh, Non-resistance leaves, uh, leaves you in a state of stagnant passivity and deadened complacency, where non-violent resistance means that you do resist in a very strong and determined manner. Well, I don't think that's true if anyone has ever lived with... By the way, now he's responding to... Uh, I believe this is what... Uh Malcolm X referred to him. He said, I think Malcolm X said something along the lines, and it's been a few years, maybe a year since I've listened to Malcolm X in this interview, uh, talking about how um, Dr. King and his message of love is, is basically weak in that, uh, you're, it, that he was doing, um, basically working on the side of the white man to make him feel better um, about uh, about things, uh, how the country was, and, and what they've been, what they had been doing. So, um, this is his retort to that. He says, uh, "You know, I don't necessarily agree with what Malcolm X had said." Here he goes. A nonviolent movement in the South, from Montgomery on through the Freedom Rides and through the sit-in movement and the recent Birmingham movement, and see the reactions of many of the uh, extremists and reactionaries in the white community. Uh, he wouldn't say that this movement makes, uh, or this philosophy makes them comfortable. Uh, I think it arouses uh, a sense of shame within them often in many instances. I think it uh, does something to cut, touch the conscience and uh, establish a sense of guilt. Now, so often people respond to guilt by engaging more in the guilt evoking act in an attempt to drown the sense of guilt. But this, uh, this approach certainly uh, doesn't make the white man feel comfortable. I think it does the other thing. It disturbs this uh, conscience and uh, it, it disturbs this, this sense of contentment that he's had. Well, so that was Dr. King. And I think this is uh, one, of the, one of the most important things he said. And he said a lot, by the way. And... I've had I've had so many conversations with people. By the way, this this guy, uh, this alt right guy, I believe that um, he has said, if I'm remembering correct, that uh, if, I think he coined the term kinetic action. Uh, he want he wanted to go out and basically oppose uh, the left and essentially goad them into attacking him so he could kill them. This is essentially his. His, his stance. This, he, he wants to, to, to try to get them attacks, to attack so he can respond with, you know, with fr or he can respond to violence with violence. And as a result, kill gun grabbers because that is what he thinks is the right thing to do. He believes that we should be trying to make sure there's as, as less, as few gun grabbers out there as possible. And if it means killing them, then so be it. This is the way that this person thinks. Now, I want to I want to point out that not every Donald Trump voter, not every Donald Trump supporter, not every Republican, not every conservative believes this stuff. In fact, I do believe that these people are a very small minority inside the Republican Party. I wouldn't even necessarily call them part of the Republican Party. They have infiltrated just like the communists, the socialists, the anarchists have infiltrated. And again, by the way, the confused anarchists, the pseudo anarchists have infiltrated the left, have infiltrated the Democratic Party. The radicals have taken over that party. And if we're not careful, it's going to happen to the Republicans. But, I, you know, I, I contend that this is a very small minority. I argue 
at a, at the most, we're talking 10%, but probably a lot less, a lot, lot less than that. So it, Dr. King, he talked about shame and guilt. And this is, I think, one of the most powerful tools, the, the most powerful results of nonviolent struggle. Now, keep in mind, this is not, you know, pacifism. This is, this is, because pacifism implies that you're not responding, you're being passive, you're not doing anything, um, which is incredibly important to, to differentiate from. This is not pacifism, nonviolent struggle. You are in a struggle, you are engaging and metaphorically fighting, you are standing, but you're doing so nonviolently, and again, you're throwing yourself into the machine. And what happened with the Freedom Walkers? The, the, the people who came out to walk alongside and march alongside Dr. King, they didn't come out because they hated. They came out because they loved. They loved their fellow man. And the reason why Americans changed, the reason why people decided that segregation was wrong and it was wrong to treat blacks as unequal citizens, that slavery was wrong, to, the reason why Americans repudiated this kind of sentiment it's not because of hate it's because of love and they felt this because of the shame and guilt that they felt as a result of televisions broadcasting peaceful protesters being beaten over the head with batons pepper sprayed sprayed with water hoses rubber bullets, attacked with guard dogs. It made them feel uncomfortable. This wasn't pacifism. This was a weapon. This weapon cut into the soul of Americans, cut into the heart, pulled on the heartstrings, made people feel bad for what their government was doing made people feel responsible for what they were allowing their government to do and made people feel ashamed and that shame led people to take action to stand along Dr. King and to make sure that their voice was heard we have to come together otherwise we're going to rip each other apart we have to love each other. Even if we don't agree with each other, we have to show humanity to our fellow man. And if we don't, we're headed to darkness, folks. We're headed to some scary times. All of this has happened before. We're heading down the same road that we've, we've already been. This country wasn't founded on hate. It doesn't matter what the left will tell you. This country was not founded on hate. Yes, we had slavery. But you know what? That was carried over. That came with us. That was baggage from before. We fought a bloody civil war to get rid of that. We don't need to go back to hate. Hate is a poison. It's a toxin. It makes you weak. Love is the most powerful weapon we have. We need to love. All right, we're going to cut to a commercial break. When we come back, we should be on the line uh, shortly after that with Peter Owens. Uh, again, I'm really excited to talk with him. And by the way, if you have any comments, questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, please feel free to get us on Twitter at On The Move Show. Messages on, on, messages on Facebook.com slash On The Move Show. Uh, I'll read your messages, all that good stuff on the air if deemed worthy. And uh, anyway, I'm really looking forward to talking with him. Again, uh, Peter Owens is the editor-in-chief of Groundswell Liberty and the former host of Common Sense Conservatism. So you guys don't want to miss this. We'll be right back.
Have you visited the On The Move with Mac Worley store? We've got amazing original design t-shirts, hoodies, cell phone cases, and coffee mugs for sale at onthemoveshow.com. Just click the shop link on our homepage. You won't want to miss out on the iHeart Open Carry and Bare Arms t-shirts for only $20 plus shipping. Again, just go to onthemoveshow.com and click the shop link on our homepage. Your purchases will help make the On The Move show bigger and better. We appreciate your support. Are you an activist who needs affordable flyers or brochures for passing out literature? Or a political candidate who's looking for business cards, logo designs, yard signs, or vehicle decals? Email me, Latasha Worley, for all your graphic design needs at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com. And don't forget to mention On The Move to get a 10% discount on all graphic design services. This is Dan Sandini of DaylightDisinfectant.com, citizen journalist, friend of the late Andrew Breitbart, and cohort of James O'Keefe. I listen to On the Move with Mac Worley because the only time he's wrong is when he disagrees with me. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, pledging my life, my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me God. Join us at oathkeepers.org. Welcome to On The Move. Well into the second hour of the program, I sure do appreciate you all sticking with us. If you have anything on your mind, give us a message at facebook.com slash on the move show. You can message us on Twitter at on the move show. You can give us a call, uh, 360-450-5625. I would certainly appreciate it uh, if you would call in and give us your opinion. So I want to, we got a couple minutes here until uh, Peter Owens is going to call in. Uh, he should be calling in any minute, but um We'll go ahead and press on here until he does. Um, I looked up an interesting quote here, and and, uh, this is uh, attributed to Abraham Lincoln. He said, Do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? I think that is, uh, first of all, very deep when you think about it. If, If we're going to come together, and my idea right now is to scout the left and the right i mean i'm i'm just trying i'm trying to convince people that the non-aggression principle which if if you don't know what it is it boils down in a nutshell to it's immoral to hurt other people and to take their stuff and i have yet to find anyone who disagrees with that in the statement now they may dis- they may disagree in other areas and they may not be consistent with that application by the way but if you if you put it outright to somebody do you do you think it's moral or immoral to hurt people and to take their stuff uh I've yet to to find anyone who disagrees with that so if that is such a is such an easy thing to agree with I think we have a winning plan here folks all we have to do is to reach out to people and to connect and to listen to each other and to love each other. You know, if I show somebody who's a, uh, you know, a far, far, far leftist, and I talk with them, and I listen to them, and I let them know that I'm, you know, I'm truly interested, first of all, in hearing what they have to say, uh, and I sympathize with their fears and concerns. And then, and then we, we come together and, you know, they hear me now, first of all, because I've listened to them. In some cases, not every case, but if we are, if we're connecting to each other, and, and I'm the one that, that's, 
you know, giving the first olive branch. I don't, I don't have to agree with them. I just, I just want to listen. I just want to hear where they're coming from. If we do that, then I think that, uh, I think we may be able to recruit people even from the left. So again, I'm, I'm hoping right now, folks, that, that you'll take the time to reach out to people, not just within your own little echo chamber on the right, but also on the left. We have to, if we're going to win, if liberty is going to win, if, if this isn't just going to be something other than just an intellectual curiosity in the future, we have to continue to recruit and continue to, to explain these principles. What are they? What is the non-aggression principle? What is liberty? So at this point, we're joined by Peter Owens. And, and by the way, I'm really, really excited to, to talk with him. Uh, he's the editor-in-chief of Groundswell Liberty and former host of Common Sense Conservatism. And he's a, a former guest of ours. We've had him on the show before. Hey, Peter, are you on the line? Yes, I'm right here. Nice, nice to talk to you again, Mac. Yeah, it's great to talk with you again. First of all, uh, what have you been up to, man? How, how's things with you? Um, things are going well. Um, I took a break from podcasting and news to work. Um, spend the majority of my time on campaign work. Um, I was working as a paid intern on uh, the Don Bacon for Congress campaign here in Nebraska. And now that the election season is over and we beat the incumbent, the Democratic incumbent that was in my district, um, we were able, uh, I had a little more time because I was working about 15 hours a week during the school year and about 40 hours a week during the summer. Uh, so now that I have a little bit more time, I'm able to get back into um, the Liberty Movement more than actually campaigning door to door for it. Um, so now I'm the, owner, I'm the editor-in-chief of GroundswellLiberty.com. Um, we have news and politics, and uh, we talk about various libertarian and liberty and conservative ideas uh, like you do on the show. So if uh, any of your listeners are interested, it's GroundswellLiberty.com. Um, you go there, you can sign up for our mailing list or check out the articles that we have. Outstanding. Outstanding. So, uh, and by the way, guys, I highly recommend you check it out. That's uh, GroundswellLiberty.com. Uh, I checked it out uh, earlier today. Uh, you guys are doing awesome stuff, man. Uh, it, congratulations on the big, big move there, and uh, I think uh, I think that's really cool. So uh, I wanted to, to pick your brain here. Um, it, first of all, uh, what is your reaction here to the election? Um, how, how are you feeling after after the you know the presidency or the presidential election? So I'm feeling cautiously optimistic is the word that I use because um, it's been very back and forth on um, President-elect Trump now. He's been very back and forth on advocating for some um, more conservative and libertarian views and then going back to his more a right-wing style of European populism. Um, what I find pretty disturbing um, is his vows to leave, Na- leave NAFTA in the first 100 days of his presidency. And that's especially scary, scary because... Um, President um, Obama has paved the way for him, for Trump, to do that unilaterally. So, in theory, Trump could do that by himself without Congress in the first hundred days of his presidency, which I think would be disastrous to our economy. Um, other things about Trump, I think it is good the way that he has called for um, a lower taxes, but that's accompanied with him not calling for lower spending in many parts of the economy. I think his plans for infrastructure improvements are misguided. I don't think that's how an economy grows. Um, I think his calls for lesser regulations are good, however. Um, so I think there's a mix of bad and good, but he's obviously better than anything we would have done with um, a President Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I feel the same way. I'm cautiously optimistic as well. Um, you know, I, I said earlier in the first hour, I am one of those kind of people that I, I hope the best and prepare for the worst. Um, I can see things turning with Donald Trump uh, into a really bad situation because, I, first of all, I don't believe him to be a conservative, uh, and maybe he'll prove me wrong. Maybe he'll be, you know, the, one of our most conservative presidents. And I hope, I really do hope that I I'm wrong and he proves me wrong. Uh, but I don't see that happening. Um, it, you you said something. I, I just I kind of want to pick your brain on this a little bit here because uh, you you said that leaving uh, or ending our agreement on NAFTA would would be bad. Uh, can you explain why you think that would be bad for the economy? So um, I think NAFTA. Um, I don't think it's a perfect deal. I think that it allows for too many trade restrictions um, on the part of all the countries involved. So I think I mean it's been proven um, empirically 
And it's been proven by many different sources that uh, free trade in general is good for an economy. Um, it's good to have open markets, and free trade brings up everyone's standard of living by allowing for cheaper products, um, allowing for more specialization of a country's abilities to produce certain goods, and by allowing for a comparative advantage for each country to do what they would do what is best for each comparative advantage, advantage in their industry. It allows for the best specialization, specialization of industry in each country country, which allows for the cheapest products and the most jobs all around. I mean, and that's been proven empirically time and time again by economists for the past three or four hundred years, and then it's been proven currently today that new developments don't change anything. So I think what uh, Trump and populists are doing right now is seeing the false song of trade protections, because trade protections have only increased over the past um, 60 years. They've increased, in, other than things like NAFTA, We've increased things like subsidies and various other non-tariff trade barriers, uh, which are a little more. They're not exclusively. They're not explicitly trade um, tariffs, but they're also they're trade barriers that hurt trade. Um, and other countries are doing the same thing. Like China's, what Trump says is manipulating their currency. That's really no different than what we're doing with the Federal Reserve. So for him to call them out for currency manipulation is just is relatively hypocritical on the part of America, where we're still subsidizing our entire agricultural sector. And I come from Nebraska, where most of what we do is corn. But I still think that subsidies for agriculture and subsidies for steel, subsidies for most things inside of the United States is detrimental to trade, because it only allows for other countries to do the same thing. So like him labeling China and Mexico um, trade makers and attacking them on subsidies, and then turning around and doing the same thing, I think, is hypocritical on the international stage. So I don't think that's one thing, one thing that we should definitely not do. Because by reducing NAFTA, we're not going to be able to trade with Mexico in many cases. They're going to add um, import restrictions and tariffs on importations of things like steel and corn, because one of the main exports to them and to China is agricultural products, uh, which, in, which brings a large part of business to our economy. So by... Uh, cutting off NAFTA, it's going to hurt a large sector of our economy, which I think will be disastrous. So, uh, okay, as far as I understand it, I don't want to put words into your mouth. I just want to clarify this point here. Um, from what I from what I understand, you're saying it's it's not necessarily the ending of NAFTA that is going to damage the economy. It's the associated trade restrictions, or as you said, the false song of trade protections uh, or protectionism uh, that would follow in the form of tariffs and, and things like that. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Because NAFTA requires that Mexico, just to, in the same way that it requires us to have free trade open to Mexico's products, requires that Mexico has free trade open to our products. So I think by removing it, uh, uh, Mexico, and by removing it and adding trade restrictions, Mexico would do the exact same thing. Yeah, well, I mean, it would it would start a essentially a trade war if we were to impose tariffs ourselves. So, it, it, just to give you a heads up, I uh, am extremely distrustful of these uh, trade agreements. I I do not support NAFTA. I don't support the TPP. Uh, I support the free market. And it, the way I look at it is, if we didn't have of NAFTA, we didn't have the TPP. Uh, you know, these. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to trade with each other. If Mexico or China decided to impose their tariffs, uh, that would be their government getting in the way of what the people want. It want in their own country. Uh, if if some other nation doesn't want to have free trade with us, I think that's up to them, and I don't think that we should follow suit and, and engage in that trade war, and I do believe that it is a bad economic policy. As you said, and I agree, it's it has been empirically proven not to work, so if other nations around the world want to you know, isolate themselves, and and they don't want to do free, uh, you know, free trade business with us. Uh, I think they'll learn the lesson uh, that comes with that, uh, because it's it's a very bad economic policy. And uh, again, I don't necessarily think that leaving NAFTA in and of itself would be bad for us. I think that leaving NAFTA and uh, imposing tariffs would be bad. I absolutely oppose uh, oppose uh, tariffs and uh, will not support that. Would, do you disagree with any of that? I do disagree with that, actually. I think that um, one of the most, I think that by leaving NAFTA, I think what you said is that we should allow other countries to um, do what their people want. 
which I don't think is necessarily true. Because I don't think that people always want it best for us. Um, I think that, I think that not just, I think us imposing tariffs hurts us, yes. But also other countries imposing tariffs hurts us. But it also so hurts think, them, though. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, it does hurt them. However, it's been shown that most people don't understand that economic policy, and most people do vote for trade protections, like happened in the United States, like has happened recently in France, like it's happened across the globe. Every country currently holds some kind of trade restrictions. So it isn't viable to just leave it up to the people and say, well, eventually they'll understand, because that's what people have been trying for the past hundred years, and it's plainly hasn't worked. So I think that's where trade agreements come in, because it mandates with reciprocity um, in trade, which is the best way to do it, because them having trade deals, trade barriers, hurts us. So by having reciprocity, we're on an equal playing field for jobs. Because by them having trade barriers and us not having trade barriers, it does hurt our economy more than it hurts them. So they would, in a kind of trade war, they would be able to choke out our business interests. So that's why having trade reciprocity is the only way to actually have free trade. Just if you don't, if we are the only one with an open market, it is still good. However, then having a closed market is damaging to our economy. That's why having reciprocity is good. Also, another benefit of having trade deals is the ability to have institutions um, that are uh, multi, multinational institutions that are able to enforce rules across the borders. Um, I think that one of the problems with trading without trade deals is things like money lending. If you lend money to another country, a lot of times um, without a deal, without any deals in place, you're not, uh, the lenders aren't able to collect on their loans. Or if someone something steals someone from, something from you, um, if they do anything that is illegal, if it's done inside an American free market, um, but they do it on an international market, not having trade deals in place means that the other country would be wouldn't be forced to act um, with the force of law against them. So if they, for example, um, they another country, for example, defaults on their loan there would be no way for you to collect on that own. However, with trade deals, you're able to do things like that, which only aids um, trade and it aids the market. So by not having any sort of institutions in place and not having reciprocity, you, there's not actually freedom in the market. So I think that's why free trade deals are good, um, because it allows for reciprocity and allows for institutions. This kind of reminds me of uh, Bush saying that in order to save the free market, he had to abandon the free market. Um, it, it, because for me, and, and you know, look, I, with, it, just, with all due respect, you know, I disagree. Um, the I believe in unfettered free trade, and I, I I understand that free trade is the absence of government preventing you or getting in your way from engaging in the market. Now, if if other governments and of other citizens of uh, other nations decide to get in the way of their citizens and engaging in free trade with us, you know, that's not our problem. That, that It may be damaging to us, but I think it is equally, if not more, damaging to them as well. And I do think that the the economic lessons that they will learn because of a result of these terrible economic policies, that will hurt them. Uh, because, again, you, you and I both agree that maybe the people won't understand this, but the people in power, I think, will. And it as a result... It, you know, I, th I think maybe some, some people will will realize that the, these protectionisms uh, are failed policies. And I, again, it's clearly we have seen evidence uh, throughout history, time and time again, that these policies do not work. So I think it, we don't need to have a trade deal with with other nations. And I'm not necessarily interested in having my government uh, or, or you know a collection of government uh, uh, enforce rules across borders i i don't want my government involved in in trade i don't want my government to get in the way of trade and I, the way i look at these trade deals is first of all they create bureaucracies that uh in the for, in the in the instance of tpp it's it's creating a international body of bureaucrats that could potentially supersede the us constitution and our sovereignty here so i i have a lot of um, a lot of distrust about that. And, and furthermore, I think that this, in, in a lot of ways, uh, creates a almost an international crony corporatism where these trade deals favor big companies 
and, and it, it really does hurt the little guy. And, and as even as you admit, uh, NAFTA does have trade restrictions, which uh, I again I'm I'm pro free market. So I, I'm I I would support getting out of NAFTA. But I would not support the institution of tariffs on our side. Now, if Mexico, China, Japan, whoever decides to do that, I think that's a stupid economic policy, and they'll pay the price for that. And you know, if if they're gonna if they're gonna shoot themselves in the foot, I, I don't we don't we don't have the authority uh, or the right to tell them how, what to do in their in their own markets. It, we, that's that's up to them. They're responsible for their own stuff. We're responsible for our own stuff. And I just. You know, I just support the free market, and uh, you know, I'm I'm not I can't I personally just can't get behind uh, backing restrictions for the free market. But I understand right. where you're coming from, though. I think I'll respond to each of your points um, in turn. So first, you said that like it kind of sounds like you must um, abandon the free market to have a free market, and I disagree with that because I think the role of government, um, and I think you would agree, is I don't want to put words in your mouth, is to protect against force and fraud. So I think that oh, wait, what wait, I would say for, force and what force and fraud force and fraud. Um, I would I would say that uh, that the purpose of our government is to protect life, liberty, and property. Okay, yeah, I agree. I agree with that. So, if um, to would you also say it, would you say the government has any role in enforcing contracts that are signed? Um, yeah, that would be through civil civil courts and and things like that. I mean, I, th- I think there's a there's a role there to play through the civil system. Yes. All right. So I think that's the only um, thing. Other part of the trade deal when I said institutions is that a civil court system that allows for um, enforcement of contracts. Because if you have completely um, no law on the international markets, you allow for contracts to be broken. Um, that's what the international. Um, civil courts allow for is contracts to be upheld in an international system is without any sort of enforcement of contracts, um, which is still part, that's not removing anything from the free market that is part of the free market. Part of the free market is enforcement of contracts. So without enforcement of contracts, we're unable to ever um, have actual economic activity on the free market. So that's the only thing I was saying about any government action in the free market. Um, um, yeah, that's a fair point. It, you know, it, it's as far as the broken contracts are concerned. I, I mean, you, you do make a fair point. Uh, what I will say though is, if it, let's say there's a bad actor out there and they're breaking contracts left and right, do you think that's going to have an effect as far as uh, on the free market and, and how people deal with that bad actor? Do you think that they're going to get more business or less business? I, mean, I think they definitely will get less business, and I think that is one way that the free market does deal with it. But I think. Um, I think that it's still important for there to be institutions there to protect and to uphold contracts because if contracts aren't being upheld, um, there's not much trust. And I think trust is really what is the backbone of an economic system other than free markets. I think free markets largely um, act on trust. And if you don't trust anything in a specific country, uh, you'll never be able to trade with them. Um, which I think is bad. So I think more, the more trade, the better. And so, so I think by so, upholding... Well, well, con- one, one sec. I just, I just want to piggyback on kind of what you're saying here. Uh, because we're not ta- I'm not talking about the government trading. Uh, I'm talking about individuals. And, yes, absolutely. Uh, individuals, if individuals are weighing the risks associated with trading with somebody who has a sketchy reputation that they've gone back on their word and, and they've proven to be untrustful, uh, if... Do you think? First of all, I, I'm I'm not for creating you know international bodies to enforce international law on other people and things like that. That the, I, I I don't really like the whole international bureaucracy thing. That's that's kind of not my thing. Um, but I I'm, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, my my point though is that do you think that the government should step in and start uh, start basically putting themselves between uh, nations and individuals or individuals in nations and uh, individual in our nation uh, and and try to be the, the moderator in this situation. Do you think that's the role uh, or do people have personal responsibility for the risks that they're taking when they're when they're trading with people with bad reputations? You know, I definitely see a point that we shouldn't. Um, I definitely see a point that it should be up to individual responsibility. And I think that... Um, I think we've seen that it helps um, on a, if it works, if we have civil courts in the United States, um, 
I think that your same argument could apply to people even inside the United States. Um, That's a fair point, so too. Do you think that we should have any court system or any civil court system, um, a federal a federal civil court system, so people um, between different states, or should we leave it just up to personal responsibility and not trading with anyone who has been deemed by others to be a bad trading partner? So... Okay, let, let me let me clarify, because I, I do think that there is a role for um, for civil courts in, in so far as uh, when somebody dam- causes damage to someone else, uh, you know, costs them money, destroys their property, things like that, uh, it, or you know, uh, whatever whatever series of things you, that you could potentially be talking about. Uh, but I I don't think. Because, again, our government was created to protect life, liberty, and property. And our government's purview is with inside the United States. I don't think that our government has a right to go outside of our country and start trying to create bureaucracies of international groups that are then trying to, it, trying to get in between us and the free market to get in to get in between this that's not that's not what i want now i mean if if i'm being consistent and uh, you know i'll i'll give some more thought on civil courts uh, and and contracts i do think that you have a right to contract and i do think that if if we're if we're looking at the court system uh the civil court system uh that it it would be protecting property uh in order to it, for the government to be uh, protecting people in, in contract agreements. So if somebody violates their contract, I think you have a right to contract. And I, you know, if, if you violate that contract, that could be seen as a violation of someone's property rights because you had an agreement. And again, I think that is the that is the, fe- the not necessarily the federal, but the government's role uh, to protect property. Do you disagree with any of that? No, yeah, I think I think the, the job of the federal courts, so as as is outlined in our constitution, to only step in if it's between parties of different states. Um, so if there are two people in separate states, that wouldn't go to any one state, it'd go to the federal government. Um, I think that's why trade deals are good, because it establishes deals between nations rather than like one large, like I'm not a big fan of the UN. I think that that's why we should have individual deals uh, with other countries, and that's what makes the best um, option. That's why I'm actually against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because I think that it has too much corporate um, cronyism. This is NAFTA on balance was a beneficial deal. Um, and that's why one of the reasons that I think that we should continue NAFTA. I think that there could be some new negotiation of NAFTA. Um, I'm not opposed to negoti- negotiating NAFTA, but I'm opposed to this wholesale leaving NAFTA. Um, and I think that's, in the end, I think that's what Trump is going to do. Because in the art of the deal, he said that he aims to um, start high and end low, or start high and end in the middle. Um, so over, over, uh, ask for more than what he wants. So I think he's going to ask to leave and then move to um, renegotiate because the uh, prime minister of Canada has already said he's open to renegotiation. So I think that would be beneficial. I just against the wholesale leaving of it because I think the reciprocity in trade is beneficial. Okay, I, I mean, again, I, I can understand where you're coming from. Uh, so. You know, I, I I actually like where you went with that uh, as far as Trump and, and the art of deal or the the art of the deal. Um, do you think that Trump is actually going to impose tariffs, or is this whole thing just a ploy, just to start high and end in the middle? Do you think he's using this as a negotiation tactic, and he really has no intention of actually imposing tariffs? Um, no, I think he actually will impose tariffs. I think that. Um Tariffs um, will, I think he will argue for tariffs um, in the renegotiation, which would be bad. I think he's been promised and showed that he is, that's one of his main platform positions. Um, I'm not sure the extent to what tariffs he's going to have. But he's going to do something by the way of trade protection tools, because that outlines the entirety of what his, if he really stood for, was helping uh, working class folks um, in various um, downtrodden communities. That's why he won Wisconsin. That's why he um, did well in Michigan. That's why he did well in Virginia. It was because of coal mining and was because of union job workers that um, were disenfranchised by the Democratic Party. So I think that's one, that's one of the reasons that he said he's not going to cut entitlements, which is one of the big problems to have with Trump, uh, is him not cutting tit- entitlement programs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he's, he's claimed that he's going to protect uh, Social Security and welfare and Medicare and 
you know, one of the things that he's actually been discussing now is um, he he's so it, it depends on on who you're talking to. Will depend on 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 their opinion on this. I'm hearing people who are Donald. Trump supporters supporting him and saying that he hasn't gone back on uh, uh, repealing Obamacare. Again, uh, he said that he's going to repeal and replace, and I've argued from the beginning that he's going to replace it with Trump Care, and it's not going to be turned over to the free market again. It's I want it repealed. I don't want it replaced. I want to get rid of the regulations restricting the free market and allow people to engage in in whatever health care or insurance that they they want to go find it i don't care if you live in washington and you want to buy something that's from florida you should have the ability to do that without the feds getting in between you and your doctor or your insurance um so have you been following the news and and hearing how uh how uh, president-elect trump is now talking about how he wants to keep a lot a a lot of the quote-unquote good parts of obamacare like being able to keep your children on on your health care insurance until age 26, uh, not allowing insurers to discriminate against uh, people for having pre-existing conditions and things like that. Uh, have you followed this? And if so, what are your thoughts? So I think that we should. Um, I'm split. When we say no replace, I think that um, I think there is something that needs to be done about health care. And obviously, I'm not uh, for anything being done about health care with a um, actual. Um, not for anything to be done about health care by the federal government. I think the only thing they should do is repeal various things they've done in the past. For example, like you said, allowing there to be cross-state, cross-state trade, um, what Trump said as removing the lines around the state. I think that's one thing that needs to be done. I think that um, a lot of the things need to be removed. I'm in favor of removing any restrictions on who can be in your health care plan. I think that should be something decided by the insurance company. But I also think the insurance company should be able to decide if they accept someone into their program for whatever reason. Um, so if you want, if you want to, you don't. I don't think you have to um, necessarily be covered if you have pre-existing conditions. I don't think that's really how the healthcare works. I think there will be companies that will advertise that as a specific option in their plan, and that's how they've done it before. It's just a little bit more expensive, and it should be because you're getting more care. That's why I'm in favor. I'm uh, not opposed to charging men more for driving insurance, car insurance, or women more for health insurance. Because if you cost more on average, I think you should be charged more on average. Yeah, yeah, I, and and I I don't disagree with that in principle either. You know, if if uh, I- anything else to force a company to it, to cover somebody who's going to cost more, and therefore in order to do that, you have to subsidize that cost. If they're not going to pay more, you have to subsidize it by charging other people more money and, and basically ha- you know it getting your redistribution it redistributing wealth that is essentially what it is and in principle I absolutely wholeheartedly oppose redistribution of wealth especially forced redistribution of wealth now if you want to give away your money that's on you and you have every right to do so as a free thinking individual but I don't think that anyone else has a right to come in and tell you what you have to do with your property uh, so and, and again I just don't I don't see how, and many pundits out there don't see how you can maintain, uh, you know, all of these "quote unquote" good parts without instituting many of the bad parts that Trump supposedly doesn't agree with or support, like the mandate, the employer mandate. Um, what are your thoughts? Could this be done? Could we have a a, a repeal of Obamacare uh, and replace it with whatever Trump's design is without having an employer mandate while still having the the pre existing condition uh, exemption for people? Oh, uh, I don't think so. I think Trump's um, going to have a big problem um, because he said that you shouldn't let anyone go without health care, um, and he said that multiple times during the campaign. I don't think Trump actually intends to have a free market solution. I don't think Trump has any real appreciation for the free market. Um, some, none of his policies are, um, on principle, pro free market. If any of them are reducing um, anything to make it more free, that's all out of pure pragmatism. Um, I don't think he has any principles, so I think um, he will be persuaded to give health care to people. Um, I think he will. I think he will maintain some kind of mandate. I think he will um, replace it with something that's not as bad as Obamacare, but still bad, which was one of my big problems with the Republican Party this election cycle, that they're going to repeal everything, but uh, make some, we put something there that's just as bad 
um, or maybe not as bad, but just a little bit worse. So that's what I'm fearful of with Trump and healthcare. Um, I think that's what, in the end, he's going to do is um, take it, um, say he fixed Obamacare, and then we're going to get slaughtered in four years because um, we didn't do anything that's really free market. Yeah, yeah, and you know, just to remind people here, and I'll go ahead and play the clip. Uh, Donald Trump has essentially endorsed single pay- payer healthcare. This was a year ago. This is while he was in the uh, the primary running. He was talking about how the government's going to pay for health care, and he doesn't care if he loses uh, Republican votes in the process. He understood that this was not a Republican policy. Here he is, is his own words. Everybody's got to be covered. This is an unrepublican thing for me to say, because a lot of times they say, no, no, the lower 25% they can't afford private, but universal health care. I am going to take care of everybody. I'm, I don't care if it costs me votes or not. Everybody's going to be taken care of much better than they're taken care of now. The uninsured person, right, is going to be taken care they're of. They're going to be How? taken care of. How? I would make a deal with existing hospitals to take care of people. And you know what? This is probably make a deal. Who pays for it? The government's going to pay for it, but we're going to save so much money on the other side. Yeah. So that's this is not true. And- and this is called single payer health care when the government pays for everything. I, I don't believe that Donald Trump is going to replace it with, with something better, as as you uh, you alluded to, uh, Peter. I, I I think it's going to be far worse, and I think it's going to be this is the wet dream of the Democrats. This is what they wanted, but couldn't get past, which is why they designed Obamacare uh, Obamacare to fail and crumble under its own weight. Uh, do you do you disagree with the, the way I'm thinking here, or no? No, and I think that is what he said there does come out, I think they could, we could have it. I'm confident that a Republican-controlled um, um, Congress will put a stop to anything like that. That's why, that's why I was saying that I think that we will have something um, that is better. Uh, so, to me, that's why I think that in the end we will have something a little bit better, just because the presence of a Republican-controlled House. But I'm not saying, I think that there is still a chance that Trump will try to get something passed that is single payer, that is um, just as bad or, or worse than Obamacare. Um, I'm not as hopeful that the Republicans, these spineless and feckless representatives that we have in Congress, uh, are going to do much to oppose uh, to oppose President-elect Trump. I just don't see it happening, especially with him uh, having the bully pulpit. And uh, this guy has, has been relentless uh, at bullying people and getting people to fall in line. So I, ju- I, I personally, I just don't see it happening. But you know, I, I you know, I, I, we'll see. I guess I, I, I don't know. I, I think what'll probably end up happening is these people will fall in line as they get, they get onslaughted by Donald Trump tweeting out, uh, you know, the you know lion so and so or the failing you know senator or this and that. I think I think Trump will will beat people into submission, and I I just don't see things happening well, and especially with. Uh, Trump's lack of appeal with the millennial generation. I, I think, it, at a, at a worst case uh, scenario here, and this actually may, this may be not even the worst. This is a, uh, you know, a probable case scenario. Is that it's after uh, Donald Trump. Uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think it's going to be very unlikely uh, if he if he does what he has said he's going to do. I think it's very unlikely that we're going to to see Republicans get reelected. Uh, um, maybe not in four years, maybe in eight. But I think at some point here, the Republicans are going to lose power. And again, I, I've, I'm hoping and I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll, they'll use this time to make it impossible for anyone to, to use the government force uh, against people's natural rights. Again, I, I want to see them dismantle the power structure rather than, than build it up. But I, I have a question for you here. And I think this is going to blow our audience's minds uh, for those who aren't familiar with you. How old are you again? I'm actually 16. I'm a junior in high school. 16 years old. So it, this is I. This gives me so much hope. Ah, I give I get so much hope talking to you, young millennials out there who are, are engaged and, and informed. Uh, man, you just impress the heck out of me. I, I have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm excited for the future. I think we can do a lot of good. And I just want to respond really quick to your point that you think that Republicans are going to fall into line. I'm basically I'm counting on uh, Trump's what we saw during the primary his lack of principle. I think that he will be able to uh, be formed by his um, his the people around him. I think he has still people in his cabinet of people who would oppose um, 
universal health care. Not all people that I agree with, but I think the majority of people that he's going to be listening to will oppose universal health care, which, which is why I'm confident. I think I, I, I have more trust in Republican um, kind of people than you do. Um, I think that listening to a lot of them speak, um, I had the privilege of listening to Paul Ryan when he came um, to my city. I listened to Paul Ryan, listened to the House Majority Whip, um, and a lot of the different people um, that actually are players in Congress. So I'm pretty confident that we will um, not see universal health care under a Trump administration, but I definitely see a possibility for it, like you got lined. And uh, let me just uh, let me just double check here. From my math is correct. In 2008, you were eight years old. Is that correct? Um, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, well, give it time, man. Give, give it time. After uh, maybe a few more years, you're gonna you're gonna see uh, what these Republicans uh, are about in Congress. Uh, the only thing that they care about is getting reelected. And um, it based on you know just based on from 2008 to now. Uh, if if you if you are seeing what they've done and, and how they have told us that, you know, we're going to fight Obamacare. We, you just have to get us both houses of Congress. And then we got them both houses of Congress. And they, they're, they're more worried about getting reelected than actually doing what we elected them to do. We gave them a majority in both houses and they didn't do anything. They said, we have to wait until we get the presidency. And now that we have the presidency uh, and both houses of Congress, uh, we'll, we'll probably hear the same excuses. Oh, you know, we, you know, we can't, do it now we don't want to be too divisive or whatever i just i think if if they're thinking that the public is on donald trump's side and again he's a populist candidate um i think that they're going to be more concerned about getting reelected because their first job is to get elected their second job is to get reelected, and everything else is just you know tertiary issues to them at that point so you know it Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're right. Uh, but just based on my experience of, of dealing with these people and seeing seeing what they have uh, have done over the, the just the past eight years, I have very little faith in in anyone in Congress. Uh, you know, th- there are some people that that you know I have more faith than others. But I, you know, personally, I just don't trust politicians. So, you know, I, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree on that, and we'll see as time goes on. Uh, I wanted to pivot here. And, you know, I think this is crucial to talk about with you as a millennial because you are the future. People like you, your generation is the future. So mm-hmm. I-, I wanted to ask you, as a millennial, what do you believe is the issue of our time that we need to face? What's the most critical thing in your mind right now that we have to address? Um, I really think the most, let's say, um, I think culturally the most important thing is um, a more fundamental understanding of what free speech is. Because you see hypocrisy on um, free speech on both sides of the aisle um, in our culture. Uh, for example, like conservatives saying, oh, if I see someone stomping on the flag, I'm going to beat them up or something like that. Um, or liberals, uh, I mean, they're or leftists, as I usually call them, um, because, I mean, it's, much, it's a much more accurate term of of uh, defining the progressive left that is taking over our country. Agreed. I think that leftists um, largely don't have um, much respect for freedom of speech unless they're the ones talking. Um, I think, for example, um, I don't know if you were watching the Ben Shapiro, um, the whole um, debacle at DePaul where he got banned and threatened mm-hmm. to be arrested if he steps foot on campus. Yep. Um, so I think that is one example of leftists not understanding what free speech is. But also in calling for free speech after the Hamilton incident. I don't think people understand that you have an ability to call, to disagree with speech, and then still recognize their right to say it. Because I don't think um, what President-elect Trump said was saying that they shouldn't be allowed to say something, just that they shouldn't be saying something. So I fully respect um, the right of leftists on college campuses to say things that are offensive. However, I will say um, that you shouldn't be saying that because it's wrong, or um, you should be saying that because it's offensive. Um, even things that Milo said, I think he shouldn't be saying some of those things because they are offensive. And I believe in some sort of decency. I don't believe in political correctness. I don't believe in saying and not saying things because they're not true. I think if, they, if there's truth, we should speak it. But if it's just offensive to be offensive, like Milo, 
you know, he gets hurt, he says things just to elicit a reaction. I don't think that's always the best option. That's why I have five minutes with Milo in the past. But that doesn't stop him from having the ability to speak. Just because you disagree with someone's speech, um, like President Trump did, um, saying it was bullying, uh, I don't think that he, means that he is saying we should ban that kind of speech. So I think that's the most important issue, is a more fundamental understanding of what freedom of speech is, and learning to foster speech and disagree with it respectfully. Wow. Yeah. I, you know, I got to say, I'm, I'm impressed, man. And, and you know, I, I do agree that's a very pressing issue. Free speech is so important. I, if, if you don't have the right to speak your mind without fear of, of rep- reprisals or retaliation, if you don't have that basic freedom, uh, it, you know, it, this this is the building blocks for all other freedoms. This is th- this is in essence natural rights, and you know I, I would agree with you. This is a very important uh, topic that we should we should be focusing on, and it is probably the issue of our time right now because of its assault. Uh, in addition, not just including uh, you know individual speaking, but the freedom of press. And uh, you know I'm I'm concerned about uh, Trump's position on the press. You know he's he's attacked the press before. He said that he's he wants to be able to loosen libel law so that you can sue the press, not for reporting uh, untruthful or inaccurate news, uh, but for reporting things that are intentionally uh, negative. So uh, about him, and and that is uh, that that's what he believes. So this is, I think the the left is going to continue to assault the media. I think that Donald Trump and his administration will continue to assault the media, and as a result, free speech is going to suffer unless we we rise up against it. So, and I don't, I mean that in a metaphoric sense, not a uh, revolutionary sense as far as taking action against the government in, in that form, uh, but. You know, I, I I think the the issue of our time right now is understanding that it is it is it really understanding what is what is moral governance and and this it may sound like an oxymoron but I, you know I believe that it is immoral to hurt other people and to steal their stuff and this is the basic uh, you know premise of the non-aggression principle and if I don't have the right Right, to hurt other people or to take their stuff. I don't have the right to hire other people to hurt other people or take their stuff or to elect people, vote for people to hurt other people and take their stuff. So I think that if if we can convince the majority of Americans of this fundamental basic principle that I think most people agree with, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, do, do you agree with that, that it's immoral to hurt oh, yeah, people I, and take their I, stuff? I do agree, yes. Okay. I'm a little bit shaky on um, the non-aggression principle um, taken to its full extent, I don't think it's the perfect uh, representation of what libertarianism is. But I think it is the basis of what libertarian sh- libertarianism should be. Well, it, I, well, there, I don't. Go ahead. I don't think that um, you can say that uh, libertarianism is exactly the non-aggression principle because I think there is more. Um, like I said at start, I think the force and fraud, I think fraud should fall under. I don't think I think fraud is um, not specifically aggression, but I think it should. Um, the I government should aggression. do things to fight fraud. I would I would consider fraud aggression. Uh, if you're if you're hurting people, i.e., damaging people, uh, taking their stuff. If you're fraudulently, you know, lifting their money from them, uh, I I believe that's that's an aggression uh, an aggression, and that viol- that should violate the non-aggression pre- principle, in my opinion. You disagree with that? Well, I do agree with that. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, just I think the defin- it all depends on the definition of what um, aggression is, and I think that's where uh, the map is a little bit misleading when it just says aggression. Uh, and that's the only problem, thing I have with the map. I, it's not that I disagree with the map in any way. It's that I don't think it is clear enough. I don't think it's the best tool for studying of liberty. I think it is a tool for studying of liberty. Uh, you know, we can we can agree to disagree on that too, and that's fine. Uh, so, so let me ask you. I guess if we're going to talk about the NAP, the non-aggression principle, uh, it, where specifically do you think it's okay for people to use government to hurt people and to take their stuff? If if the if that you don't like to to apply it consistently across everything, because uh, we both agree that fraud is aggression. So other than that, wh- where else would would it be okay to to use government to hurt people and to take their stuff? Are you still there? Oh, looks like we lost him. Oh, here he is. He's calling back. Hey, Peter, you there? Yes, I'm sorry. The call, must have dro- the call dropped out there for yeah. a second. No worries. Um, I'm not in favor of uh, the government ever taking anyone's stuff. And it's not that I disagree with any way. 
I think the NAP should be um, used um, to its almost fullest, fullest extent. Um, I think that I think there are a couple of uh, situations where um, taxation is um, all right. I think that things like um, um, I think things I don't think income tax is in any way moral or in any way applicable. But or I effective. do think or effective, yes. Um, but I do think things like uh, consumption tax is all right because you're choosing to live in that society, and I think that's where consumption tax can be used. I also think that a property tax, in my opinion, is is moral um, because we have to ask ourselves what I think a property tax on unimproved property, um, for example. So um, I think by the homesteading principle, you property is rightfully yours when you put it to use, uh, when you improve on it. However, uh, you have no moral right, I would say argue you have no moral right to land that you have not um, done anything with. That's why I think a property tax on unimproved land is moral, because you have no moral right to that land. However, you might have a right to the government, because if the government sells you that land um, as a means to an end of having someone take private ownership of that land, I think mean, if you buy that land, I think there is a point to having a tax on their land because you have no moral right to ownership. All right, let me just – I want to I wanna dive into this uh, this nutshell here for a second. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You just stated you, you don't have a moral right to land that you've not improved. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So let me ask you if, if you if you bought a house and you bought the house and you lived in the house for years and you haven't improved it at all – uh, do you have a moral right to that house? I think you have. Um, I'm not saying that no improvements. I'm saying that no improvements have been done to the land. Not there have been uh, no improvements. Not that you have not done any improvements. If someone else, I'm talking like if it's a purely undeveloped field, if there's nothing in the field, you have not used it for other culture, you have not used it for anything whatsoever, if it has just sat there, you have not lived there, if it has not been any real purpose. I think mean, that's where you have no moral right so, uh, to the land. But I think, do, do you do you believe ahead. in? I, I'm I'm just going to assume, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you you do believe in the right to property, correct? Yes, I fully believe in the right to property. So but I think I would ask you, where does the right for property? Where do you have the right to property um, come from? I think it comes from God, um, your natural right. So I don't think that you have a natural right to land that you have not improved. Okay. Um, and I would just argue, I would ask you why would you have a right to land you have not improved? Why what right what right do you have to that land? Who gave you that land? How did you get the land? Well, if I if I bought the land, then it's it's and it's, and it's my pro if I bought it from another person, let's say somebody owned. So how did that how did that person have a right to the land? So so you can you can follow. By the way, you can follow this same argument that you're using with every single piece of property that you have. So you. you you either have a right to property or you don't. I disagree with that. I think that property um, is you have a right to the fruit of your labors. That is what property is, the fruit of your labors. So it's something that you have created. Um, you can sign it away. You can, give, you can sign a deal with someone to have them give you things, you improve them, and they have them, and they pay you something for them. That's what, Paul, that's what a job is. However, I think that that's why you have a right to ownership of the things you create, and you can buy those things and sell those things. However, you did not create the land, therefore you have no right to it. However, if you, if it is improved land, if you, um, for example, use it to farm, or build a house, build a school, build something um, for use in the free market on that land, it does become used, because that now land is the fruit of, part of the fruit of your labors. So, um, however, what, what, did you, land, what, what did you create to buy the home? You you created wealth, did you not? You, you yes, created I agree. money. If, so it, I agree you, with you that you have right to. If you bought a home, you have right to that home. And if you buy land that has been improved, not I'm not saying improved as in you specifically have done improvements. I'm talking to land that has had, had improvements done on it in, at any specific time. If at any time that land has been put to purpose, if at any line time that land has been developed now it is actually property but before it is not property it is purely land so, so and how, can, how can you apply a property tax to, to land if it's not property 
I'm not okay. So property tax is just the term. It's a land tax for land that has not been improved. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, look, I, we're just gonna have to, I guess, agree to disagree because, you know, I didn't create my car, but I created the wealth that allowed me to purchase that car, and I have a right mm-hmm. to my property. I have a right to 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 barter or trade. I can make one item and trade it for another and I still have a right to the item that I just traded because I created whatever it was that in, it allowed me to purchase that item or maybe I created money which allowed me to buy something to trade for that item. So it, I agree with you. I agree with you. This but is if a, you buy if you ahead. buy a car, uh, if you buy a car you do have a right to that car. But if but someone I didn't created create that the car, car, I never created that someone car. created that car. Someone created that car. And someone created that car and chose to sell it to you. And since it is actually property... Who created so the metal? Exact- who, who created the, the, the rubber? Who created all the parts that go into that? The, these are all... This is all raw material that was pulled out of the earth or harvested in some way. If, if we're going to go by the same logic as what you're saying, that God created the earth and, and that it, the, the property itself, the land, no one created, so no one has a moral right to it, then no one created the rubber in my tires or or, or the, the fabric that that was that was used to cover my seats all of this stuff is from the earth if we're, I mean I'm just I, I'm just trying to apply this consistently do you see where I'm coming from though I see the argument you're making however here's where it fails is because when you take that rubber when you are taking that rubber when you're mining the rubber that's in, that's doing something to the land that is improving the land that is maybe the word improving is where um my, my addiction is off, but I'm actually doing something with the land, um, using the land, putting the land to use, um, developing the land, anything you want in turn, um, developing the land, using the rubber. Once you make something out of the rubber, once you even build a mine to take the rubber, once you begin to take rubber out of the land, um, anything you do in that sense, then it becomes your property. Mm. However, um, what is not your property, what is not your moral, you have a moral right to property once you do something. Once you develop that land, it becomes your property. Once you do anything to that land, it becomes your property. The land that is not, has not had anything done to it, you have no moral right to ownership. However, you do have a governmental right to ownership because um, that property um, was used. You were given the right to property by the government because when you say, oh, I bought the land, Yes, you did. You did buy the land. But someone originally was given right to that property. Back, there was a long time ago when no one owned the land because all lands, all things start from nothing. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning of time, no one owned that land. Um, so someone had to be the first one to own the land. That's why we're asking, where does the right from property? Where would you, so the right to property does not come out of nothing. The right to, pro- the right to property has to come out of something. Because you cannot purely put a fence around somewhere and call it your property. If that was a thing, I would put a fence around most of... I would come to America and put a fence around all of America and say, this is mine. I cannot do that because I do not have any more right to it. Are you familiar the with way, the, the, like the westward expansion? Because this is essentially what the people staking their claims did. They built a fence around land and claimed it as their property. And then they built a farm on it. Yes, but they built a they built a fence around the land. This is I mean this is what the this is what the, I guess this is the fundamental difference here. I actually, believe I, Westford, I, Expan- Westford expansion was done by the majority by the Homestead Act. It was actually called the Homestead Act. Uh, agreed. Okay. Okay. All right. That, I mean that's that's a fair point. Let, let's let's move on then. Uh, I'll concede that okay. point. Uh, given uh, given that the uh, I think. We both agree, and maybe maybe I'm mistaken here. We both agree that the right to property, and maybe I'm wrong here, uh, that the right to property is a natural right that is not given given to you by the government, as you as you said just a moment ago. You said that the right to property is is given to people by the government. Uh, I the disagree. R- I did not. I did not. Say, I said that the right to land, the right to unimproved land, is something given to you by government. Um, okay. The right to property, the right to the fruit of your labors, is a natural right. I see. Okay, so uh, you know, I, I just I think that land and the things that you use to buy the land, the things that you use your property, your wealth, your money, your resources, 
resources, your time, your sweat, uh, all of that belongs to you. And I believe that those are natural rights that the government doesn't give you. And I, apparently you agree. Um, you know, I, I, I guess we, this is going to go way, way, way longer than, than what, I, what I had intended. But, I, you know, I really, first of all, I, my hat's off to you for, for standing up for what you do believe in. You know, even though we disagree, I, I respect your opinion. And, you know, I hope that you'll consider more about property rights as well. But let me, let me ask you, let's, let's put a pin in this for later. And let me just finish it with this final question. If you believe that you have a right to your property, as long as it's been improved in some way, let's say you planted a tree on that property and now you've improved it, or someone in history has, has planted a tree on that land and it's been improved in some way uh, to meet your criteria, whatever that definition may be, uh, and you now have that right to property, you have a moral right to property, as you've said, uh, does the government have the right to tax that property? No. Okay, so so basically, you only support property tax or, or land tax on uh, land that has not ever been improved by anyone, correct? Yes, which basically means property tax in the United States is not ability because most of the land has been improved by someone. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is this is really uh, we're we're way deep in the minutia here of this topic because uh, it really <laughs> doesn't apply that that much to a whole lot. So you know, I, I can I can agree with that insofar as I think it's a step in the right direction. But I you know I disagree with property taxes. It, it, I think it's fundamentally uh, it, immoral because we're, we don't own anything at that point. Everything is therefore owned by the government and. We're we're simply serfs uh, paying our rent to our overlords, and this is not uh, this this is not the way our our country was founded. Uh, and I, you know, I again, I do not believe that the government has it has any stake in this. That they are not the ones who gave us property rights. We have those innately, and we okay. gave the government the ability to protect our rights, not to violate them. So. Uh, it, I just I want to ask um, one final question here, and then we got to run, and I got to move on to the next segment. Um, but it, this episode is titled "Hate versus Love," and I just want to ask, uh, what do you think is a more powerful force, hate or love, and why? Um, to me, I think love is a more powerful force, um, just because I think that when you have respect, when you have love for someone else, I think that encompasses all other things. Um, I think that sometimes it can seem like hate um, is winning the battle, but I think love will win the war in the end. Um, I mean, it was written in the Bible that um, we know what the outcome of our um, world is. We know what happens in the end, and what happens in the end is that God is victorious. I think mean, love is victorious in the end. I don't think hate and Satan and evil do lose in the end. I think love and truth and Christ will win in the end which is why I'm still confident in the future. All right. Well, well first of all, uh, I want to give you an opportunity here to plug your stuff and give out your social media, website, all that good stuff. Uh, go ahead and do that now. All right. So uh, y'all can find me. Um, the website is groundswellliberty.com. Um, you can just type that into your address bar and go on right over to the website. And the Twitter handle is, um, I believe you tweeted it out on your account, but the Twitter handle is groundswellusa. So that's Groundswell, and then USA. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to um, slide in my DMs, ask me anything, um, or email me. My email is peter at groundswellliberty.com. So feel free to go to my website, sign up for a mailing list, uh, check out the stuff I have, um, and uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, thank you very much for a great discussion there, Mac, and I really would like to say again that I do respect everything you say. I think we agree on almost everything. Uh, I mean, the small thing about unimproved and improved land, I think that's one small <laughs> thing. Uh, I think we agree on 99% of this stuff. Yes, so I appreciate sir. having a chance to speak with you. Yes, sir. This was a very stimulating conversation for me, Owen, or Peter. I, I really, really had a good time talking with you. And, uh, and, and would you be willing to come back again one day, man? I, I really enjoyed this. Definitely, and I would like um, to have you um, in some capacity, rather either in a video or in a podcast or in an article we do on my website, I'd love to have you on. Yeah, that'd be great, man. Anything I can do to help you guys out, let me know. I'm happy to help. All right, fantastic. All right. Well, have a nice Yeah, have a good one, man. Thanks for joining us, bud. Thank you very much. All right, take care. All right, folks, we're going to cut to a commercial break. When we come back, we're going to be 
Diving back into these featured topics, what have we not touched? Well, let's review. Uh, we've talked about why the alt-right is, is anti-liberty and dangerous. We've discussed uh, how they are uh, hate mongers, essentially, and uh, anti-free speech, pro-killing people for uh, saying things that they disagree with. And uh, uh, we played the terrifying audio of Kai Morose on hate. I also countered that with Reverend King on love, power, and nonviolent struggle. Uh, what we've yet to cover is Donald Trump here. We're going to dive in for the last 45 minutes of the show. Uh, a, a Donald Trump supporter was arrested for wearing a T-shirt, and, and uh, I want to talk about a, a situation that happened with a man who was wearing a MAGA hat, that's a Make America Great Again hat, uh, who was allegedly attacked on an NYC subway. And then I want to play a clip here uh, from Learn Liberty uh, that, it's titled Making Sense of Trumpism, and I think it has a lot of important information in it. You guys don't want to go anywhere. A lot's still on the agenda. Also, if you want to give us a call, the number of the show is 360-450-5625. Again, that's 360-450-5625. You can get us on Twitter at On The Move Show. You can message us at Facebook.com slash On The Move Show. We'll be right back after this break. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Have you visited the On The Move with Mac Worley store? We've got amazing original design t-shirts, hoodies, cell phone cases, and coffee mugs for sale at onthemoveshow.com. Just click the shop link on our homepage. You won't want to miss out on the iHeart Open Carry and Bear Arms t-shirts for only $20 plus shipping. Again, just go to onthemoveshow.com and click the shop link on our homepage. Your purchases will help make the On The Move show bigger and better. We appreciate your support. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore with the support of like-minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright, you're listening to On The Move with Mac Worley III. And we are well into the third hour. This is the overdrive hour. This is where we cram in everything that we didn't get an opportunity to get to. Big shout out to Peter Owens, editor in chief of GroundswellLiberty.com. I really like that conversation. He's got a good head on his shoulder. You know, we don't agree on everything, and that's again the beauty of liberty. We don't have to agree. We can we can talk, we can talk out our differences, and you see, he was absolutely right. You know, we were so far down into the minutia of uh, of property rights. It really, we're, we're arguing over the 1% differences that uh, ultimately, you know, if, if we can work together on the things that we agree on, we can push ourselves, we can turn that dial of liberty further towards liberty, to, further towards individual rights, further towards constitutionalism. So uh, I got a lot of respect for him. He's uh, he's a great guest, and I hope you guys really enjoyed it. And don't forget to check him out, Groundswell Liberty. It's awesome. Um, I go, please, I can't say enough about it. Also, uh, a shout-out to the405media.com and youthrevolt.com. Uh, we, uh, we broadcast over on their networks as well. I really appreciate them giving us an opportunity to, uh, to reach their audience 
audience and speak to the the people that they have in in their network. So uh, shout out to them and uh, please feel free to check them out. That's the 405media.com and youthrevolt.com or I'm sorry, youthrevolt.org. Excuse me. And um, so anyway, uh, let's go ahead and move into the featured topics. Uh, When we last left, we were talking with uh, Peter Owens and let's go ahead and talk about the Trump supporter who was arrested for his t-shirt. Crazy, crazy stuff. So anyway, uh, here is the, uh, the article. This is an article on foxnews.com. Uh, Trump voter in Texas arrested over deplorable t-shirt. Uh, this is from October 28, 2016. And the article was written by no name on it. I hate it when they do that. I want to give credit where credit is due. Anyway, um, the article reads, A Donald Trump voter in Texas was arrested Monday morning for wearing a t-shirt to the polls that mocked Hillary Clinton's infamous comment in which she said half of the Trump supporters were a basket of deplorables. Brett Moth, I believe that's how you spell his name, M-A, or say his name, M-A-U-T-H-E, age 55, was arrested in Belvedere, I believe, Texas, after wearing a pro-Trump hat and t-shirt saying basket of deplorables, according to KSAT 12. Moth told the outlet that while he removed the hat at the request of the officials, he refused to turn his shirt inside out and said he was not aware that wearing it was a violation of the election code. When he refused to remove the shirt, he was arrested. Other voters told KSAT they didn't realize the rules which prohibited electioneering by the voting booths applied to voters. I don't feel like you should be preaching to anybody, but I do feel like you should be able to wear a shirt if you want and if it has the candidate, or I'm sorry, if it is, I'm sorry, if it has the candidate, yeah, that's what he said, I don't really understand, and if it has the candidate. Uh, local resident uh, Georgina Paradin, Parada said, uh, so that's what she said, uh, Cynthia Jaqua, <laughs> I, I hate pronouncing last names, this is like the worst, I'm so bad at this, uh, anyway, Cynthia Jaqua. The Commo County Elections Coordinator told MySanAntonio.com that it is almost unheard of for anyone to be arrested on an electioneering charge, but noted that Moth's behave, <coughs> behavior is in violation of the code. Electioneering is prohibited within one within a 100 yard, I'm sorry, within a 100 foot marker. Uh, you cannot express views for or against a candidate or political party by wearing buttons, t-shirts, hats, whatever else, or carrying signs, she said. Moth was released on a $500 bond and is charged with a misdemeanor, which carries a possible $500 fine. So, I would love to hear from you on this. Uh, Give us a a call, 360-450-5625. I want to know what you think. Is this uh, something that is good or bad? Should we not be allowed to have our free speech, our freedom of expression within a hundred feet of the voting booth? Now, the argument against this, the argument to create a no free speech zone inside this little bubble, this hundred foot bubble on the election uh, or near the voting booths is that, you know, people shouldn't feel like they're going to be harassed or intimidated when they go to the polls. On the flip side is do we or do we not believe in the right of free speech free expression um, should people be silenced uh, so please let me know what you think 360-450-5625 again 360-450-5625 get me on twitter at on the move show on facebook.com slash on the move show I really want to hear from you guys on this issue now let me tell you where I stand on this I personally uh, I don't like it. Uh, I don't like the fact that people are silenced. Um, now, I can understand if somebody's being being intimidated uh, into um, into into voting for someone else, or you know that there's protests outside of voting uh, vo- voting booths or uh, outside the polls that are preventing people from voting. Voter intimidation, voter suppression. These are not things that uh, that I think uh, are moral. I I do not think that anyone has a right to prevent you from voting. Um, and again, if we're talking about natural rights, you know, you 
the, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, it lays out a series of negative rights, things that the government can't do. But one of the few jobs that the government does have to do is, a, is, is to give you the right to vote, to, uh, to get, well, not necessarily give you the right, but give you the ability. They, you have a positive right to vote, and the government has to provide you that ability. So that's the difference between negative and positive rights. Now, I don't think that in this case, this gentleman should have been arrested. I think this is one of those situations that, uh, you know, this, again, just wearing a button or a hat, who's being harmed? This, again, is the non-aggression principle applied. Uh, Is someone harming someone else? And is someone taking someone else's stuff? This I apply to everything. Uh, I fully believe in the non-aggression principle. And I have yet to find one situation uh, to include taxation. Again, this is why I believe in, in uh, voluntary taxes. But, you know, I'm, I'm probably in the minority there. Uh, but this is, this is the way I live my life. I, I, I have a moral code and my moral code is don't hurt others, don't take their stuff. It's so simple. When you apply all of your problems through that lens, things become so simple. And the only difficult part is getting over your predispositions against a position. Is is getting over your your bad habits essentially, things that you thought were correct, and now looking at them, there you you can see that they're not being you're not being consistent. And you're not applying this position to all of your viewpoints. Um, again, I've yet to ever meet anyone that thought it was okay to hurt people, that it was moral to take their stuff. I've I've never met anyone who who said that that, that was moral. Everybody I've ever spoken with has said it was immoral. Now, that may not necessarily mean that they, they would they've never done those things but you know they, they would they at least acknowledge in that moment that that was an immoral act and i do think more morality is important so in this instance this gentleman he's not hurting anyone he's not taking their stuff he's also not preventing anyone from voting and engaging in their positive right to vote so i do not agree with this there's, I think there is a difference between electioneering and voter intimidation, voter suppressing, uh, suppressing, and some individual out there just wearing something uh, for their shirt, or even you know sitting. Is it illegal to sit there and talk in line with somebody saying why you're voting for the candidate that you're going to vote for while you're waiting in line? Is that illegal? Yes, that's that's illegal. That's electioneering. You're not al- you're not allowed to do that. Who is that hurting? There is no victim. Who is the victim? Would somebody feel uncomfortable if they're voting for the other person? What if, what if they were asked, "Oh, uh, who are you voting for?" and they didn't want to say or say, "You know, I'm, it's my vote. It's personal. It's private." Uh, it, maybe they would feel uncomfortable. Maybe they would leave. It's a, it's a potential. That's case by case. Uh, but I ultimately do not believe that this law is just. Uh, and I, I don't support this. And again, I'm, I never voted for Donald Trump. I don't, you know, I, I, he's not my guy. I, I have little faith in him, but again, I, I've said, I hope that he is conservative. I hope that I've been wrong about all of my impressions on him. And I hope I've, I have misapplied what he said or misinterpreted what he said, or, you know, maybe, um, he's somebody different than who, he has claimed to be Um, but even though this guy is advocating for somebody who I I didn't vote for uh, I think he has every right to wear a Trump hat and a t-shirt you know he has every right to express himself this is this is freedom of speech and (sighs) Peter was right Peter Owens uh, Owens was right about freedom of speech being under attack and it very well may be the issue of our time because it's not just this instance it's not it's it's not, not just um the next story we're going to talk about it about the individual who was attacked for wearing the make america great again hat um but it's also instances like ben shapiro not being allowed to talk 
to to people at universities. Uh, I actually have a clip about Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro talking about uh, the situation at DePaul University. He was on the Megan Ke- uh, or the Kelly file with Megan Kelly. Here's a clip. We'll go ahead and play that before we get to our next story. The tense scene unfolded on another campus just hours ago when conservative commentator Ben Shapiro was prevented from stepping foot onto the campus of DePaul University in Chicago. Shapiro was invited by DePaul's Young Americans for Freedom chapter, attempting to defy a ban instituted against him in August when the university said Shapiro was not welcome to speak on campus due to security concerns, allegedly. Here's how it unfolded. The bottom line is it's private property, okay? And it, and the, what the proper procedures weren't followed and you're not going to allow So it might understand that if I take three steps forward, you will attempt to have me arrested? If you create a problem and you will not you know, leave the campus, yes. Okay, so just to, be, just to be clear, if I attempt to enter that hall right there and sit down just to listen to somebody speak, or if I attempt to ask a question so, or to engage in free speech, you will have me arrested. At this point, yes, sir. I'm also glad that uh, in a city, I mean, clearly you have great security. I'm glad in a city that has uh, some 4,000 shootings to this date. You have 30 members of security just for a 59165 Jewish guy. Wow. Joining me now in a Kelly File exclusive, Ben Shapiro, editor-in-chief of The Daily Wire. Here we go again, Ben. Here we go again. <laughs> it's incredible how, I mean, time after time, these college campuses won't even let you speak because you get shouted down by intolerant people when you try to go, and then they say it's a security concern. Yeah, it really is amazing. This one was actually particularly amazing because there wasn't a protester anywhere in sight. So you had 30 security people but they could, and a they sheriff could picture from Cook one in their heads. Right, exactly. So they'd actually internalized the, the rioters so well that now they could actually reflect them back out to the world. They're tolerant of anything except somebody actually giving a speech on the topic of free speech. That is the actual topic Can of just speech. That say that again. Say that give. again. The speech that I was giving was about free speech, and they are tolerant enough to ban it. So that was exciting. It's Unbelievable. You were not allowed to speak about free speech at all. This is what modern day university campuses have come to. Not, not in all cases. There's the University of Chicago that denied people their safe spaces. But in, in this case, so you showed up there to make a point about free speech and you were arrested. Now, does it have any public dollars coming its way, this, this university? Uh, I, I don't know. It's a private university, which is why I didn't actually just attempt to walk right past security. If yeah. it's a public university, then it would have done so under my First Amendment rights. Exactly. Exactly. private university. So once they made clear that I would be arrested if I took two steps forward, then what I did instead is Christina Hoff Summers, who joined me at this, at this lecture, she actually Skyped me into the lecture hall, oh. and then we told everybody in the lecture hall to get up and walk out, and we all walked over to a, to a theater that was about three blocks away and did the event anyway. What, what, do, what do the kids who, if there are kids who are protesting, young adults, your presence, say? Do you know? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I think that they're, they're just offended by, by anybody who has a differing point of view. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking tomorrow at University of Wisconsin at Madison, and one of the key reasons that they're protesting me, apparently the big protests are planned, is because I'm pro-Trump, which is weird since I wasn't. So it, it, it's, they're, they're just Trump. making things up. Yeah, yeah exactly. right, so. exactly. And then they, they will left con- let controversial figures from the left come and speak. It's just not somebody who's got strong views from the right. We've seen it so many times. Ben, good for you for trying. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot. Remember that old, that old First Amendment chestnut? The answer to speech you do not like is not less speech. It's more speech. Boom. Mic drop. Look, I've been saying that for years. The answer to speech you do not like is more speech, not less speech. If somebody says something you don't like, <laughs> suck it up, buttercup. It's a tough world out there. Things are not going to go the way that you... You may exactly want it to go. You know, as, as Donald Trump, his campaign uh, song, you can't always get what you want. That's true. Sometimes you might be offended. But you don't have a right to not be offended. There's n- Look in the Constitution, please. There is absolutely nowhere in there that says that you have a right to not be offended. Uh, specifically, you have a right to speak your mind. You have a right to use your speech to advocate for whatever the hell you want as long as you're not hurting other people or taking their stuff and you're even allowed to advocate to hurt other people and take their stuff however here's the caveat if your speech incites people to hurt other people or to take their stuff that is where 
the Supreme Court has drawn the line. It's like you can't yell fire at a in a crowded movie theater. You know, it, again, I, I I don't think that that outright should be illegal to yell to to yell fire in a crowded movie theater. But if what you've done has led people to be hurt, if your actions, i.e., your words, if if you saying or yelling fire has caused people to panic, and then people have gotten hurt as a result, then at that point you are liable. And just like the people who were in Ferguson's, uh, the father of, uh, I believe this was Michael Brown's father, if I am not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong, folks. Let me know. Uh, but I believe it was him. He said that people should burn that city down, essentially. I'm paraphrasing. And then what happened? People burned the city down. So he actually incited things. His speech led to things. Uh, so there is a difference here. But going to, a, uh, going to a university, speaking about things, even if it's controversial, even if people are going to protest against you, even if it's going to potentially cause a security concern, um, that shouldn't be prevented, especially when this is not applied consistently down the line. When the left, they're allowed to have their speakers, but no, 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 the right is not allowed. However, this is a private university. And this is one of those issues that has a lot of minutia, folks. You know I love the minutia. You know I live there. Uh, so let's just point out that a private, com- a private company, private university, somebody with private property has any right to do whatever they want with their private property. This university was well within their rights. They're douchebags, but they're well within their rights. Uh, so... You know, Ben Shapiro was right not to challenge the police on that instance and take the few steps forward and get arrested because he would have been violating the property rights of that university. Now, again, in a free market, the way that you you solve this stuff is more speech. Talking to people like he did on the Kelly file. Telling people what this university is doing to Paul. At that point, if the free market thinks that it's okay that what this university is doing, how they're treating conservatives, how they're treating uh, the left differently, how they're violating the free speech rights, how they're treating these these students uh, like beautiful and unique snowflakes and protecting them in their little glass-encased safe spaces, their their cry zones. If people people agree with this and if, if people support this, then they'll send their children to DePaul University. If they have a problem with it, they won't. And that is the free market working. Again, no force anywhere in there. There's there's no force unless someone's rights are violated, in which case that's where the federal government, state government, whatever government we're talking about, can step in and 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 step in only for the purpose of protecting life, liberty, and property. So, again, um, Speech, speech is so critical. Speech is so important. And, you know, I mentioned Suck It Up Buttercup. I might as well talk about this. By the way, uh, uh, a friend of mine suggested I I talk about this on the show, and I want to shout out to him anonymously. You know who you are. Thank you for suggesting this. Uh, About Iowa's new bill. Uh, uh, This is, by the way, this is an OregonLive.com article. Article is written by Douglas Perry. um, And... The article is titled, Iowa's Suck It Up Buttercup Bill Would Criminalize Donald Trump Protests and Close Cry Rooms. Um, anyway, the article continues and goes on here. To paraphrase Leslie Gore, it's Donald Trump's party and you can cry if you want to. At least not, or I'm sorry, and you can't cry if you want to, excuse me. Uh, at least not in Iowa, uh, at least not if Iowa State Representative Bobby Kaufman gets his way. The Republican plans to introduce a bill in the state legislature uh, he's calling Suck It Up Buttercup that would penalize state universities for helping students deal with the fact that, that Trump is the president elect of the United States. The bill would fine colleges for providing grief counseling, cry rooms, and therapy, ho- uh, therapy horses? Horses? Really? That's a thing? Therapy horses. Okay. All right, more power to you folks. You need some therapy horses, uh, right on. Uh, Anyway, and uh, therapy horses for students claiming to be emotionally battered by the election. (laughs) Kaufman has dissembled on whether he's uh, being hyperbolic with the use of uh, terms like cry rooms. 
He might be thinking of students at New York's Cornell University who held a cry-in to protest Trump's election. Iowa's three state universities insist they have not funded cry rooms or any grief counseling related to the election, Radio Iowa reports. Kaufman says he considers the post-election hysteria of Democratic women, minorities, homosexuals, and others who feel threatened by Trump's campaign statements to be incredibly annoying. College's efforts to coddle election stress students, Kaufman says, are a waste of taxpayer dollars. And that doesn't, and also that doesn't prepare uh, kids for life. In life, there's winners and losers, and when your car breaks down, your kids get sick, or you have to take a second job to pay your mortgage. You don't get to go to a cry zone. You don't get to pet a pony. You have to deal with it. Kaufman, Kaufman's bill also has a more chilling component. Points out to the Christian Science Monitor, or yeah, points out the, the Christian Science Monitor. It would make criminals of political protesters who block highway traffic. Let me just let me just go back here. <laughs> let me just re, restate this here. Uh, Kaufman's bill also has a more chilling component. According to Oregon Live, again, very left-leaning. Let's just point it out. Left-leaning uh, rag here. Uh, people, you know, if, if you got Oregon, uh, you know, the, the, the Oregon, what is this, the Oregon paper? I can't remember what this was called. Uh, the Oregonian, that's what it is. Uh, this is used in Oregon for uh, wrapping fish and lining bird cages. That's why they went to a more online model. Uh, this is a rag. Uh, but anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, it would make criminals of protesters who block highway traffic. No. No, 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 no. This would not make criminals of political protesters who block highway traffic. The act of blocking highway traffic is, in and of itself, a crime. That is a crime. Uh, first of all, you don't have a right to block highway traffic. Uh, in fact, jaywalking itself is illegal. In fact, having pedestrians on the freeway is illegal. You ever seen those signs that says uh, no pedestrian traffic? Yeah, that's illegal. So blocking traffic, either in a street, because again, jaywalking, uh, or on a highway is a crime. And if you commit a crime... You should go to jail. And again, let's apply this. Don't hurt other people. Don't take their stuff. In this situation, number one, uh, are you hurting anyone? Well, you could potentially cause a, a wreck. And in addition, by the way, I've seen many videos here of protesters attacking people in their car who are just trying to get from A to B. So they are physically assaulting someone as well as blocking them from from progressing. You do have a right to travel. No one has a right to stop you from traveling. So, not only are they physically assaulting the people who they're blocking, uh, they're also violating the law to block them in, in the roads, uh, but also, uh, they are actually causing damage to someone. Someone may be going to work. Now they may be late to work. Maybe they get fired as a result. You have caused damages. You have harmed that individual maybe not physically but monetarily and in addition what have you have you stolen their stuff well maybe you've stolen their time and time is money and maybe again they lost that job now you have stolen their future paychecks now you have stolen the time that they would be at work getting paid so yes blocking highway traffic does harm people and yes blocking highway traffic does steal people's stuff. A Republican, the article continues, a Republican state senator from Washington State is offering a similar bill in Olympia. Senator Doug Erickson's proposal would make uh, economic terrorism, i.e. political protests that block traffic or make stores in, inaccessible a crime. Yeah, it is a crime. Okay, I don't know if it goes so far as to say economic terrorism... But it is a crime. It's already a crime. Uh, you have a right to protest. You have a right to do so in public spaces. You do not have a right to do so in the road. You have a right to do so on a public sidewalk. 
Uh, you have a do right to do so. You have a right to assemble in some public space, like a public university, public property, anywhere that's public, even private property, by the way. If you own it or the person who does own it gives you consent to be on that property, you have every right to assemble and to protest. But you do not have a right to hurt others and take their stuff. The anti-Trump protests are taking place across the country and Republicans quote, don't be a baby, unquote. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, let me see, maybe I misread that. And the anti-Trump protests uh, that are taking place across the country and Republicans don't be a, cr uh, don't be a baby protest should be a crime, res uh, crime response signal that both sides see Trump's election as a turning point in the culture war that has been raging in the U.S. since the 1960s. Okay. Um... I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that, but okay, well, we'll just we'll just press on. At the 1992 Republican National Convention, insurgent candidate Pat Buchanan famously said uh, there was a religious war going on in the country for the soul of America. He added abortion on demand, a litmus test for the Supreme Court, homosexual rights, discrimination against religious schools, women in combat. That's change, all right. But it's not the kind of change America wants. It's not the kind of change America needs. And it's not the kind of change we can tolerate in a nation that we still call God's country. So, first, uh, let's, let's look at some of these things. He said abortion on demand. Uh, you guys know where I stand on that. Uh, let's go to homosexual rights. You know, you know where I stand on that as well. I, 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 don't hurt other people. Don't take their stuff. Come on, folks. This is simple. Uh, discrimination against religious schools. Now, wh what in what kind of discrimination? What are we talking about? Uh, is we talking about public funding? If if the government's going to fund, uh, you know, schools, are they are they not going to fund religious schools? Uh, again, I, I I don't think this is probably I'm guessing about funding. What Pat Buchanan was saying back then. Uh, I disagree with all funding of schools, so I think they should all. I'll be funded by the people who go there. It should be private. Uh, I, I disagree with public schooling. Um, women in combat? Uh, well, uh, in my opinion, women should be allowed to be in combat as long as, insofar as, they can pass the physical requirements that men have. Uh, it shouldn't be a standard for women and a standard for men. It should be the same standard across the board. If you can pass it, you should be able to have that position. Um, you have every right, and I don't. I don't agree with a lot of what this this gentleman said here. Um, so anyway, um, the article continues, uh, but I, you know what? I, I've lost interest. I'm not really interested in talking about this anymore. Uh, but suck it up, Buttercup. It's coming to a town near you, and uh, I'm just curious what, what you guys have to say about it. Uh, hit me up at On the Move Show uh, on Twitter, Facebook.com/slash On the Move Show. Uh, I don't necessarily know how I feel about this, um, but I, I suppose I do not want my taxpayer money spent on therapy horses or cry rooms. If that is in fact happening, uh, I think that should be something they have to pay for out of pocket for themselves as individuals. Uh, they should take personal responsibility and deal with their own crap on their own time and with their own money. Uh, I don't think... Anyone has a right to reach into my pocket or yours to redistribute my or your wealth to pay for someone else's cry rooms or therapy horses. Again, don't hurt other people, don't steal their stuff. I keep reapplying that to everything. So, last week, we didn't have time to get to this. We're going to cover it now. A gentleman... Uh, wearing a Make America Great Again hat, was attacked on a New York City subway, or allegedly attacked. Here's the clip. Is also seeing backlash of their own. A man wearing one of Trump's Make America Great Again hats is attacked on an uptown train. The victim talking to Eyewitness News reporter Lucy Yang about the frightening experience. Lucy? Well, is the right to vote costing some their safety and basic rights? Tonight, in his only television interview, one Bronx man tells me he was attacked in this subway behind me for wearing a Trump hat. 
Violence is never the answer, no matter what side it's on. 24-year-old Corey Cataldo is a hard-working electrician. Last Friday, he was heading home to the Bronx when he was violently attacked on the subway. He says, oh, great, another white Trump supporter. Next thing I know, I have hands around my neck. I'm being choked. Then another gentleman comes over. He shoves me up against the wall, uh, you know, up against the window. Now, I got my arm pinned behind my back. I have the one guy choking me. This Trump supporter says what finally saved him was the next stop when one of the two attackers got off the train. Cataldo followed and filed a police report, but so far, no arrest. Do you fear you should take off your hat? Absolutely not. This hat will be on for the next eight years. Isn't it interesting that the reporter says, uh, shouldn't you, you know, take off your hat? Um, this I associate very closely with uh, the people who say uh, that women, for example, in Europe who are being raped by Muslim immigrants, illegal immigrants or, you know, otherwise, whatever, uh, who are coming up through uh, through Turkey, going into Europe and making their way to places like uh, Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, places that have some welfare, things like that. They're looking for a better life, folks. They're just looking for a better life. They just love and they, they're looking for a better life. Um, and, and, you know, they have a rape crisis going on over there. They're the rape capital of the world now. I think it's Sweden or Switzerland. I'm, I'm uh, unsure of at, at this point. I can't remember. But, uh, yeah, they've had, they've had massive rape going on over there as a result. And uh, these women are being told to cover up. They're, they're, it, this is victim blaming. You're blaming the victim for being assaulted, being harmed, being hurt in some way. So, it's your fault for showing your skin. It's your fault for showing your hair. You were asking for being raped. You should cover up your, your hair. Uh, just like this gentleman right here. He should take off his hat. Shouldn't, uh, don't you fear being attacked again? Shouldn't you just take off your hat? And he says no. And more power to him, by the way. I disagree with... You know, Donald Trump, in most cases, I believe, and again, I don't support the candidate, but this gentleman has every damn right to be out there wearing a Make America Great Again hat. He does, no one has a right to attack him, and he's not at fault for being attacked when someone attacks him for asserting his free speech, his free expression by wearing a hat. Who was he harming? No one. No one. Who was the victim? He was. Can we get past the blaming the victim here, please? And and again, this is a... They're, they're calling this alleged. He made a police report. This could be made up. But this is, I would, I would say this is a hate crime. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should, we should, you know, give it more, uh, more sentence. Again, it's assault. It is assault. But they assaulted him because they hated the views he was expressing. And the things that, that are coming out of the left are, you know, if, for example, last week we talked about the, the Trump written on the uh, NYU Muslim student prayer room. And they claimed it to be Islamophobia. They, they claimed it to be just the same as saying, get out Muslims. Look, it's vandalism that individuals should should be caught, prosecuted. Um, however, this is not, it's not the same. And, and we're seeing the left do a lot of the same things that they claim that we're doing. They're, they're claiming that there's a rise of Islamophobia, yet the example that they give in this article is a, a woman who was, who was wearing a uh, burqa, essentially, Muslim garb, uh, who is a, this a woman was a black uh, Muslim dressed in full Islamic dress, and they're investigating uh, an individual who stole her purse, backpack, and car. There's no instance here. Uh, by the way, two alleged men attack a woman, and there's no there's no instant uh, situation here where they're claiming that the guy said it was because that the woman was, uh, or that the men said it was because a woman was Muslim. This to me seems like a classic instance of someone being carjacked. Uh, so. They stole her purse, her backpack, and her car. But it's being investigated as a hate crime. And then they used, again, as another instance of social media. People saying that they were allegedly, you know, uh, uh, had somebody yank off their hijabs. 
Um, again, uh, it, this was supposedly at Walmart. And even in the article, it says Walmart has not confirmed the authenticity of this report. So, uh, look, uh, let's just stop harassing people uh, on both sides if it is indeed happening. I, I, I don't really believe a lot of what the left is saying, but I, I'm listening to them and I'm trying to give them, uh, you know, the... I'm trying to give them my ear. I'm, I'm trying to at least listen to their concerns. So we're getting close to wrapping up the show here. But before we go, I want to end this on a message of love. I want to play a clip from Dr. Martin Luther King on loving your enemies. Here's a clip. That is a little tree planted on a little hill. And on that tree hangs the most influential character that ever came in this world. Never feel that that tree is a meaningless drama that took place on the stages of history. Oh no, it is a telescope through which we look out into the long vista of eternity. See the love of God breaking forth into time. It is an eternal reminder to a power drunk generation that love is on the way. It is an eternal reminder to a generation depending on nuclear and atomic energy, a generation depending on physical violence, that love is the only creative, redemptive, transforming power in the universe. So this morning, as I look into your eyes, and into the eyes of all my brothers in Alabama and all over America and over the world, I say to you, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. And I'm foolish enough to believe that through the power of this love somewhere, many of the most recalcitrant men will be transformed. And then we will be in God's kingdom. We will be able to matriculate into the university of eternal life because we have the power to love our enemies, to bless those persons of curses who even decide to be those persons who hated us, we even pray to those persons who despitefully used us. Oh God, help us in our lives and in all of our attitudes to work out this controlling force to love and this controlling power that we solve every problem that we confront in all areas. Let us join together in a great fellowship of love bow down to the feet of Jesus, give us this strong determination, and the name and spirit of this Christ we pray. Amen. I do believe that love is the only creative and redemptive and transformative power in the universe, and I too am foolish enough to believe in love's power. I love you. I love all of you. Thank you so much, MacPack, for tuning in week after week. You guys are the tip of the spear. Thank you so much. I leave you with this one last thought. Think about what you can do in your life to spread love. All right, that's our show for today. I really appreciate you, MacPack, tuning in for for the show, tuning in week after week, giving us your continued support. Thank you so, so much. We broadcast every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at OnTheMoveShow.com. Also on Spreaker.com slash OnTheMoveShow. We simulcast on the 405media.com and YouthRevolt.com or YouthRevolt.org, excuse me, as well. Check them out. Show them your love. Connect with people. Don't forget to like us on Facebook.com slash OnTheMoveShow. Follow us on Twitter at OnTheMoveShow. Uh, and subscribe to us on youtube.com slash on the move show. And as always, know your rights, assert your rights, and get on the move.